And you may remember unit 10 is contracts and procedures. So we've talked about the contract piece of it. Uh, last class we looked uh, actually pretty briefly at our offer to purchase and contract. So now we need to talk a little bit about the procedures. And then the last piece of unit 10 is just kind of alternative, um, other different methods for conveying, not all sales are the traditional sales. So there's some options. So some of the procedures, and again, several of this stuff we've already talked about. That's one good thing about where we are. I consider us, unit 10, I consider us about halfway. So some of the stuff we're gonna start seeing, we may have already discussed before. So there's a couple uh, things to talk about when we're submitting offers to sellers. Keep in mind, this could be you, the listing agent, submitting an offer to your seller client. This could also be you, the buyer's agent, submitting an offer to the for sale by owner. Because remember, the FISBO doesn't have an agent. They chose to go it alone. So that means you, the buyer's agent, are communicating directly with that for sale by owner. So a seller is a seller is a seller. We know, we're all good. Y'all don't look at your screen. What offers do we present? Let me see your mouse move. Which ones? All of them. We present every single one. What, but Julie, what about the low ball offer that I know is going to make my seller mad? Can I just reject it on their behalf? Head shaking, no? Good. We have to present all offers. And we have to do so. We have a timeline. Line. And commission rule says we need to do so immediately but in no event later than three days so once you have an offer in your hand we're going to present it basically what we're saying as soon as we can guys remember the seller's the boss so they may look at you and say look i work monday through friday nine to five and if i take a personal call i could lose my job so we don't want to bother the seller at 245 when we get an offer, right? We don't want to upset them. They've given us instructions. If they get off at five, immediately means I can call them at what, 501? <laughs> Maybe let them get to their car. You guys are with me though. So, you know, we're, we're, we're developing these relationships with our sellers and we know what's good time for them and what's bad. So, and we do have a little bit wiggle room there because understanding the seller's busy, you're busy. I got to say, I have a hard time thinking of a really good reason of why it's taken us three days to deliver an offer to a seller. And you can't sell it if you don't present it, right? So um, just kind of get in that habit. No, it's a commission rule too. So we're delivering all offers immediately, but in no event later than three days from our receipt. And remember, you guys, we are special agents. Sales agents are special agents, which means I cannot speak. I cannot bind them. I can't commit them. I cannot accept or reject an offer on the seller's behalf. Another thing mentioned, hot topic here recently, especially, is this idea of multiple offers. Multiple offers. You have two or more offers. And I think we kind of touched on this the other night. We can all agree that in your hand and on its way are two different things, right? If I know of an offer coming, of course, I'm going to let my seller know. But is there that a guarantee that we're going to get it? A lot can happen between I'm submitting an offer to actually having an offer in your hand. So when we talk about multiple offers, we're referring to two or more offers in your hand. The fact that we have multiple offers or do not have multiple offers is not a material fact. We do not have to disclose the presence of multiple offers. As a matter of fact, it's up to the discretion of the seller if we share that or not. So if you're in a hot market, if you know multiple offers can happen, let's go ahead and have this conversation up front. I tell you guys, we've talked about this crazy, crazy seller's market we're getting out of. There were, there were quite a few agents that got themselves in trouble because another agent, a buyer's agent would call them and say, do you have other offers? And maybe they answered, maybe they didn't after talking to their seller. But guys, asking if you have multiple offers is not the problem. 
It's how we respond. You do not work to that other agent. You work for that seller. So you need to make sure that your response, there's no rule that says they can't call and ask. The rule addresses how we respond. So we need to know what our seller's thinking is. And like we said the other night, Sellers got to make this decision. I'm telling you right now, with multiple offers, buyers go one of two ways. Once they find out there's multiple offers, they either bring their A game or they run away. So the seller needs to be prepared. We might get stronger offers. If we disclose there's multiple offers, we might chase buyers away. Multiple offers need to be delivered at the same time in no particular order. I cannot favor one offer over another. It's not like we can look at the seller and say, this is the highest priced offer. Let's talk about this one. And then we'll look at the other three. If I have four in my hand, when I'm discussing with the seller, we need to discuss all four. And I cannot favor one offer over the other. But what if? What if one of those offers is from an agent in your firm? Can't you kind of just focus on that one a little bit? Because if the firm can sell it and list it, then that's two sides. That's dual agency for the firm. Isn't that better for the firm? So can't we just present that one and put the, put the co-brokered offers off to the side? What if you are acting as the buyer's agent and the listing agent. You, the individual, could stand more if you're on to make more if you're on both sides. Wouldn't it benefit you for your buyer's offer to get accepted over those other ones you have in your hand? Is that is that? Or can we do that? Is that okay? It was best for you, right? No, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so we got to present them all, everything I have in my hand when I'm talking to the seller in no particular order. Remember, and we'll talk more about this, we're kind of hitting all around it. We, um, I'm distracted, I'll come back to it. So, da, 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 no particular order, again, what we have in our hand when we present. Again, when we are presenting offers, if you know, if you hear of others coming, it might be you had a showing this afternoon and the buyer's agent calls you and says, man, my guys love it, I'm going home right now to write it up. Well, of course, I want to let the seller know there's another offer coming, but understanding there's no guarantee. Um, the seller doesn't have to wait for that other offer because the seller is free to accept any offer at any time. The best we can do is just give them a heads up. But think about it. If I'm calling them at 538 because they just got off work and I got four offers in my hand and three of them are really good, and we know of two more coming. We can wait for those other two and see what they look like, but we got three really good ones to work with. So again, we just have to have these conversations with the seller. If none of the four are good, then we're probably more likely to wait for the other two. Uh, but if you're dealing with multiple offers, especially um, you know, double digit offers, they're gonna be good, right? So now it's just kind of a matter of, of picking which one. And we need to sit down and have conversations with our sellers. Remember what I said, you guys, sellers are not reading the offer to purchase and contract. You hand them that 17 page document and you hand them that 44 times in multiple offers. They just got really overwhelmed really fast, didn't they? I mean, shoot, you hand them four and they got really overwhelmed over fast, really fast. So we need to talk to the seller about the terms. It's been my experience, sellers care about two things, how much and when. And while those are two very important parts of the contract, we now know there's a lot of other terms, aren't there? What's everybody offering for due diligence? What's everybody offering for earnest money? Are they asking for seller pay closing costs? Are they asking for a home warranty? So kind of just sharing those different uh, blanks, points with the seller so they can decide which offers best. It might be uh, different loan terms, different loan products. There's several things to consider. I'll share with you guys uh, uh, in practice that I saw coming out of this crazy multiple offer world that we were living in. What I noticed a lot of listing agents doing, and I really liked it. They were still, of course, presenting the offer. We always have a duty to do that. But then they were also creating like an Excel spreadsheet. 
and calling it like offer one and here are the important terms, sales price, due diligence, earnest money dates. Offer two, here are the important terms. Offer three, here are the important terms. So now we can sit down with the sellers, still presenting the offers, but now we can sit down with the sellers and do a very nice and simple side-by-side -side comparison uh, for them to figure out which one is best. But keep that in mind, the seller is free to accept any offer at any time, even if there has been a call for best and final offer. Sometimes you guys may see all offers in by uh, 5 p.m. on Friday. Well, if the dream offer comes in tonight, the perfect offer in the seller's mind, why are we going to wait until Friday and potentially lose that buyer? If the seller wants to accept the dream offer tonight, the seller is free to accept any offer at any time. Uh, would you still be obligated to present the actual offer to purchase document? Yes, Rebecca. And I would send it like in an email with 40 some attachments. You may have to zip it or something, but you know, you'd still have to send them the paper. What they do with it when they get it, oh, that's not on me, but I'm still going to give it to them. But then we're going to sit down and help them um, hash through it. The other thing to know, or another thing to know about multiple offers, we can't shop offers. I think another way to say this is we can't pit the buyers together. So it's not like we can say, I know this is what the Joneses are offering. Can you beat them? This is what the Smiths are going to put down for due diligence. Can you top that? We're going to see in just a second, I have a commission rule that says you cannot share the terms of an offer without the offer or's permission. Remind me who the offer or is? The one. The it could be the, the giver. The giver. That's it. <laughs> the giver or of the offer. And in this case, it's going to be the buyer. I cannot share the terms of an offer without the offer or's permission. Again, there's no rule that says you can't call and ask. Agents needed to be careful in this crazy multiple offer we were in because what was happening was buyer's agents were calling and saying, we had a showing this afternoon. My buyers really like it. We're going to go home and write it up right now. What's the highest priced offer you have in your hand? Can you, the listing agent, answer that? Not without permission of that person that made that highest priced offer. Is everybody hearing me? We need to pay attention when people call. There is no commission rule that says you can't call and ask. The commission rule addresses how you respond. So we're not going to pit them. Um, I think we touched on this too. You might be a buyer's agent. You might be working with two buyers that are interested in the same property. I'm going to present them the both information. I'm going to give them the same market analysis. I'm going to provide them with the exact same information because who makes the decision? I see Mal's move. Yeah, they do. Am I making these decisions for them? No. So I say, here's the market data. Here's our comparative market analysis based on this information. What would you like to offer? What would you like for your due diligence? What would you like for your earnest money? And then let them decide what they want to do. Buyers have different risk tolerances. And sometimes, especially when you're working with two buyers that are interested in the same property, we may need to help them find that risk tolerance. But I'm not going to pit them together. I know what both buyers are offering, but I'm not going to pit them together. And that's what we mean by no shopping offers. So let's see, if an offer comes in and they only state how much and when, is there a default that the rest of the information goes to or do we have to continue asking each missing piece of information? Uh, I'm not sure I'm following, but are, are you saying that you're, it's an incomplete offer that you left blanks blank? Um, I, I, if, if all they tell me is how much and when, I, I need more information. They haven't presented an offer. I may need some follow-up, some clarifying for that one. Welcome. So while I'm waiting on that, 
This is the commission rule. Again, you don't need to know the rule. I just put it here for reference. And this is the rule that says that we cannot share the terms of an offer without the offer or's permission. And guys, let's be frank. Is any offer or in their right mind going to give you permission to share the terms of the offer? You're the highest priced offer I have in my hand right now. Can I share that with other buyers that are interested? Sure, go ahead. They're probably not because they want to protect that offer. Um, for example, there was no earnest money listed in the offer. Does that default to none? Um, remember, we're never leaving a blank blank. So if you're not going to offer any earnest money, what should be in that blank is a zero. That's how much your buyers are willing to offer. But we're never going to leave a blank blank. There is no default. It's all negotiable. So counter offers, uh, modifications, remember any change is a rejection. Is it a counter offer or is it a rejection? We only have acceptance when we agree to all of the terms exactly how they are. If you are old school and you are negotiating with pen and paper, then any change after we make enough changes back and forth and strike through and put in the new and initial and date. You guys saw the offer to purchase and contract. I don't have a lot of space in the margins to put in other information. And if we're going to go pen and paper, um, after a while, we may just want to use a new form. Um, in practice, usually what happens is the first offer comes in on paper uh, as we negotiate or counter. That may go down via email or text. And then once we come to terms, then the buyer's agent is going to fill in and put in the agreed upon terms for both parties to, to sign. Uh, remember, though, even if we've agreed upon terms, if you got verbal, you got nothing. So if we've agreed upon terms, then we still need to make sure that we get that um, accepted by the last offeree. And that communication of acceptance crosses the line because then and only then have we formed a valid contract. Already? The other thing that commission rule says is that we need to retain all offers. You guys, if we're documenting what? Everything, we're going to keep everything. Remember my teammate that got 45 offers on their listing? Only one of those could get accepted, right? That means they had 44 rejected. Guess what? They had to keep those 44 rejected offers. So even if that offer never becomes a contract, maybe it's a multiple offer situation, maybe it's not. If that offer never becomes a contract, we still need to keep it in our, in our transaction file. That's exactly right. And we keep everything for three years from the successful or unsuccessful conclusion of the transaction. Successful meaning it closed. Unsuccessful meaning it didn't. Whenever that transaction, whenever that stops, that starts our three-year clock. So we keep everything for three years. We have an instructor uh, here with the school. She's actually a broker in charge as well. And I remember her sharing with us in this crazy multiple offer world that, I mean, her seasoned, her top producer, producing agents, she knew they were getting multiple offers, but when she looked in the file, there was only one, there was only the contract. She was like, what about all those other offers? So had to remind them because multiple offers were new to a lot of agents at that time. So what a good opportunity, what a good training or coaching moment and to remind them that we got to keep everything. If we're documenting everything and we're keeping everything, that's just the easy way to remember it. If you ever find yourself going, I wonder if I should keep this. Just keep it. Just keep it. When it comes to furnishing copies of the offer, Or 
are actually um, the offer and the contract furnishing copies. Again, this is a little bit different now than what it was back in the day before our e-world, electronic world. Um, but one way or another, once this thing becomes a contract, we need to get a copy to the other agent. Uh, we need to get a copy to our clients, buyers and sellers, or customers if you're working with the FISBO or as a seller subagent. So the parties need a copy. The other agent needs a copy. Uh, buyer's agents, yeah, I need you to get a copy to the lender ASAP. And as soon as you get a copy to the lender, go ahead and send a copy to the closing attorney. So those parties can kind of start doing their things. And again, we're getting closer and closer to talking about our, uh, our lenders. We can share documents and e-programs. We don't, you know, it's not like we have to have six versions. As long as we're sharing documents, as long as we're getting the documents, you can send them straight through the e-program. You can email it as a PDF. Um, I would note that you delivered that document, delivered that contract. I don't know if we've talked about this one yet or not. Have we talked about how many days I have to deliver an instrument? Yep, yep, three days, three days. So we have three days to deliver all instruments. And isn't it easier? I would recommend emailing it or sending it through your email. So then you have that documentation that you delivered it. And, and again, my job is to deliver it. What they do with it when they get it, oh, that's not on me. My job is to get it to them. Questions, comments? Have we touched on the part in the book about the counterparts or was it, or did you say something? I missed it. About what? Counterparts. Where you at? It's in the next paragraph. Maybe I'm too ahead. I don't know. I'm sorry. Counterparts, counteroffers. Yeah, if it says it is used to be standard practice to create six copies of the form sometimes called counterparts. So you had you had one original and then you made copies okay but today we're not dealing much with paper so in practice what we're doing most of today is the e-program sending it out yeah electronically yeah okay. but if you do have paper in your hand you can make a copy and hand it to so there's no again once upon a time ago when we were all working on paper we didn't even have to have buyer and seller sign in the same document. We could have two different contracts, buyer sign one, seller sign one, as long as they were the same. E-World has made this a lot easier for us because now we can make sure we get everybody signed on the same document and okay. we don't have that to worry about. So to kind of recap this offer to contract process, I want to walk through a scenario with you guys. And everybody sit up. Let me see you because I'm going to ask you to shake your head yes or no. We don't have time for everybody to chat. So we're just going to do, we're just going to everybody shake your head. you got two choices. I'm going to ask you some questions and you say no or yes. There is no in between. One of two options. So let's kind of refresh, walk through a scenario and make sure with this magic moment when it goes from being an offer to a contract. So the buyer offers with a purchase price of 150,000, 250 in due diligence, 250 in earnest money. They want 1500 in closing costs. They want to close in three months. They've asked for a home warranty. And of course, they want the refrigerator. Shake your head, yes or no. Are we under contract? Nah, not even close, are we? Sellers received an offer, they have three choices. They can accept it, reject it, or counter it. This seller counters. They say, I'm not paying closing costs. I'm, I'm not giving you my refrigerator. I want to close in six weeks. All other terms are acceptable. So what that means is we're good with the purchase price. We're good with the due diligence. We're good with the earnest money. We started here, we just got a little step closer, right? So the seller is countered, 
He said, these are our terms. Shake your head yes or no. Are we under contract? Nope. We just had a counter offer. Nope. So, no. Counter offer means that the roles have reversed. The seller just made an offer to the buyer now, right? The offer or, no, the offeree became the offer or vice versa. What are the buyer's three choices? They can accept it, reject it, or counter. You guys dreaming about this yet? So, <laughs> so we said the seller is countered. Now the buyer accepts. In pre-licensing world, what does that mean? In pre-licensing world, it means the buyer has signed. They have accepted. They have signed with the terms of the seller's counter. The buyer tells their agent, go for it. Yes or no? Are we under contract? Ah, oh, heads just got mixed. I got some yes and some no. Think about your musts. I must have two things. Must one, the last offeree accepted. Are we under contract yet? Not yet. I'm one step closer, but we're not there yet. So the buyer accepts. They have signed. They told their agent to go for it. The selling agent calls the listing agent and says, you have yourself a deal. My buyer has accepted your seller's offer. Now are we under contract? Congratulations, we are officially under contract. We must have acceptance and communication of acceptance. Guys, if you don't have communication of acceptance, how does the party making the offer know that their offer has been accepted? So our must, that magic moment in time when it goes from being an offer to a contract. The buyer or the last offeree accepts, and then communication of acceptance crosses the line. Questions? Yeah. So, Julie, so essentially, both parties have to have acceptance on that. It's not just like, okay, like. So, yeah. And, and Graham, you, when, when the seller counters, they're going to initial off on that. They're going to acknowledge that this is their offer. So maybe they initial, like I said, maybe the agents are going back and forth speaking on behalf of their parties. But when the seller counters, that's, of course, with their permission, their acceptance. Yep. Got it. Okay. What I need is the buyer to accept the seller's counter. And that's what we got here. Yep. Yep. And then that communication of acceptance crossed the line when the selling agent contacted the listing agent, said, you've got yourself a deal. I do have another question for you guys, but this is an A, B, C, or D. So why don't you guys go ahead and set your chats to private? Send me a private chat. I'm going to put another scenario up. up. And I want you to all to tell me in a private chat, A, B, C, or D.
¿Está bien? So let's see what we got here. On Sunday, a listing agent receives a written offer for $145,000 on a house listed for $154,900. I just realized how out of date this question was. <laughs> Not this market. <laughs> so we got it. $145,000 offer. The house is listed at $154,900. On Monday, the seller counters at $149,900. Now let's go back and think about what a counter does. Remember, a counter is a rejection with new terms. Those roles have just reversed, right? The seller is now making the, the offer to the buyer. The buyer has three choices. They can accept at 149.9, they can reject 149.9, or they can counter. Uh, so the seller counters, they present this new offer to the buyer, 149.9, and gives the buyers three days to accept. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they have till Thursday. On Wednesday, the buyers reject the counter and upon being informed, the seller says, no, 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 I'll go back and accept the buyer's original offer. Under these conditions, what do we have? Nothing. Once you reject it, once you counter it, it is dead on the table and there is no going back. In this case, could the seller make a brand new offer to the buyer? with those terms. Sure, they can make a new offer, but they can't go back. Understand, once it's rejected, it's done. And a counter offer is a rejection. So the seller says, no, 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 I'll go back and I'll accept the buyer's original offer. You can't go back. It's behind us. Um, if the seller wanted to move forward with this and they would have to uh, bring a new offer. Somebody asked in the chat, great question, would they still get the three days? That three days is to, oops, to accept. But because they rejected it, that killed, if you will, that three days. They have three days to accept it. Julie, that was me that asked that three-day question, and I have a follow-up for that. So, like, I work in a, a, a leasing department on things of like prorating things where you count the actual day on things. Um, so would you start on the, like within this, it's like on Monday, the seller counters at point forty nine. So like, would you start it that day? Not like, get the day kind of thing or would it be like literally you've got three days from the start of that thing does that does that make sense it does so when we count days we're always going to start the day after receipt okay so if we're let's see da 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 and gives them that was monday so day one would be tuesday day two would be wednesday day three would be thursday so it's going to yeah. be the day one is going to be the day after and and the reason graham is because we don't know if this went down at 6 a.m or 6 p.m Right. So if it went down at 6 p.m., you're not giving them a full day. Right. Okay. So by giving them starting on the next day, they have a full day. Day one is the next day, which what do we just say? Monday. So Tuesday, Tuesday would be Tuesday. the next day, Wednesday and then Thursday. OK. Yep. Cool. Well, Julie, I just want to make sure I'm understanding um, yeah. and I'm, I'm not having a moment <laughs> um so anytime it's rejected the offer is rejected it it, it does have to start over when it comes to the offer if, if you want to if these two parties want to move forward somebody's got to make a brand new offer okay once once it's rejected there's no it's dead there's no reviving it gotcha yep and and remember you guys a counter offer is a rejection so a counter offer is a rejection with a but. So you kill the offer. Now I'm going to turn around and make you a brand new offer with these terms, in which case you as the offeree have three choices. You can accept it, reject it, counter. Other questions?
The last piece of Unit 10, um, as mentioned, are some alternative land conveyances. Guys, please listen to me. The rest of Unit 10 is all green stars. We've gone through the red stars. We've gone through the level three material. So we just need to keep this short, sweet. You may see a question or two, but you're not gonna see the in-depth or the amount of questions that you're gonna see from the rest of Unit 10. So is everybody good if we kind of boogie through this last, this last section pretty quickly? You have your book. Uh, if you wanna know more about it, you got Google. I just encourage you to focus your study time and, and not focus your study time on this last, this last bit of Unit 10. So we're just introducing you to the idea that there are other methods to convey. Again, it's not all the traditional that we deal with, you know, 99.8% of the time. I just made that number up. So is everybody good? We get through this pretty quickly. So some alternative land conveyance methods, some alternative methods to convey. We have something called an installment land contract. And with an installment land contract, the buyer is paying the seller as always, but they're not paying them in one lump sum. They're paying them in installments. They're gonna make payments and we gotta agree on those payments. We gotta agree if the seller is going to, um, you know, are they gonna earn uh, uh, interest on these payments? When we get to our financing units, we're gonna introduce you guys to seller financing. Seller financing and installment land contracts are very similar. The difference between the two is when the deed changes hands. In an installment land contract, the deed changes hands when the last payment is made. So if you're paying a year or 20 years, whatever the parties agree to, the seller gets to keep the deed. They retain the legal title. The buyer gets possession, they get equitable title, which means they have the right to live there. They have the right to use the property, but they're not gonna get title until that last payment is made. Compare that to, that's exactly what it is, Tank. It's kind of like our lenders, like our mortgage lenders, isn't it? Compare that to seller financing, the buyer's making payments to the seller, but the D changes hands at closing. So again, the difference, um, but with these, the seller keeps the title until the last payment's made. With installment land contract, it's like you're buying a house on layaway, right? You make all the payments and once you pay it off and you go get your title, you're buying a house on layaway. So let's look at an example. Buyer agrees to purchase real property and to pay the seller in the sum of $105,000 in the following manner. Going to give you $5,000 at the execution of this contract, the balance of $100,000 uh, together with an interest rate of 12% until paid in full. Said principal and interest shall be payable in 240 installments of no less than X amount per month, beginning on the 18th day of March 2019. So it's clear how much the buyer is going to pay, how many times the buyer is going to make that payment. After 240 payments, the deed changes hands. Pluses and minuses to everything. <laughs> For the seller, uh, some advantages of the installment land contract, they still own it. So they may be able to reap some tax benefits. They're collecting money on it. So they may be able to reap some tax benefits. Tell your sellers to talk to their accountant, stay in your lane. This could be an easy way for a seller to sell a hard to sell property. Maybe we need a special buyer that, that knows what they're doing with a hammer and can do some you know handyman work kind of things, for example. So this might make a hard to sell property more desirable. The biggest advantage to the seller is they get to keep the title. If this buyer defaults, the seller has to give them time to cure. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but they have to give the seller time or the buyer time to cure. And if they can't come up with the whole note due, game over. But the seller still has the title until that last payment is made. Of course, the big disadvantage to the seller is they're not going to get it in one lump sum. If they need all that money right now, then this may not be an option for them. But if they can handle the installment payments, um, 
the, the smaller pieces at a time. For the buyers, their advantage, this could be a good option if they have poor credit. Maybe they've uh, recently had some medical issues and their credit's not to where a lender could give them a credit. So maybe the buyer and the seller uh, can work something out. Um, there could also be tax advantages to the buyer. Again, they're living there. They're going to be the one paying taxes and special assessments and all that good stuff. So there may be some tax advantages. Have them talk to their accountant. The biggest disadvantage to the buyer is if they default. If the buyer defaults, it means they missed a payment. Now, there is a general statute that says the seller has to give the buyer uh, 30 days to cure the default. If you can't come up with the whole note due in 30 days, you're out. It's kind of like the banks in foreclosure, right? We'll let you miss. If you miss, though, and you can't make it up, we're going to have to take the property. Also, remember, the buyer doesn't own it yet, so they can't use it as collateral. They can't pull liens on the property, take like an equity loan or something like that on the property. I got another shake your head yes or no question for you guys. Listing agents. You have a property listed for sale. You get an offer in from a buyer to do an installment land contract. Do I have to present that to my seller? I see most heads shaking yes, and I agree. Why? Because we present which offers? All offers. And an offer to do an installment land contract is an offer. We've got to present it to them. We got to let them know um, what the term, what the proposed terms are, and give them the option to accept it, reject it, or counter it. Another alternate conveyance method is something called an option to purchase real estate. This is our example of a unilateral contract. In a unilateral contract, how many sides have to perform? How many sides have an obligation? Uni means just one. Everything we do is a bilateral contract. Go back to the beginning of unit nine. Everything we do is a bilateral contract. The option to purchase is our one example of a unilateral contract. And with an option to purchase, the buyer has not agreed to buy. The buyer has simply been given permission to explore the option. At the end of the option period, they have a decision to make. Either they buy or they don't. The option period is negotiable. It could be, you know, a couple days to explore it. I think where we see these most often, uh, for example, might be in commercial properties. So maybe you want time to explore the commercial property without the seller selling it from out from underneath you. The only promise made in an option to purchase, the only obligation, what makes this a unilateral contract is that the seller can't sell it to anyone else during this option period. The buyer's like locking them down. Let me rephrase that. The potential buyer is locking them down. So they get this option period. At the end of the option period, we're gonna agree to all the terms up front. So we know if the buyer buys, this is the price, this is the date, these are all the terms. The buyer explores their option. At the end of the option period, they either buy it now becoming a bilateral contract or they don't. What in the world would make a seller agree to do something like this? I don't know much that speaks louder than money. With an option to purchase, there are two forms of consideration. Remember consideration is one of our requirements for a contract. So one form of consideration, we have that agreed upon sales price. If I decide to buy, this is the price I will buy it for. But then the buyer, the optioner, is going to give, or the optionee is going to give the seller an option fee. What's going to make the seller agree not to sell their house to anybody else for two days, two months, two years? Money, money, money. And the option fee is usually pretty healthy. 
cut me a check for ten that ten thousand dollars to buy my house you want two weeks to decide heck yeah where do i sign all you're doing is locking me down and saying i can't sell it to anybody else um, if the buyer does agree to buy most of the time the option fee will be credited back if they don't agree to buy they pay the seller for that time and again all terms are negotiable listing agents you get an offer in to do an option to purchase. Do you have to present that to your seller? Yes. I wish I saw more head shaking. Yes. Yes. Why? Because we present all offers. Never, ever trick y'all selves. <laughs> if an offer comes in for anything, whether you want to do it or not, remember, it's not up to you. By the way, I should have said this with installment, but both the installment land contract and the option to purchase, we do not have pre-printed forms for these. So in both scenarios, we're going to have to get an attorney to draft up the agreement. We do not have pre-printed forms. They're so rare and there's so many what ifs, a pre-printed form isn't going to fit the unique situations. So if we are involved in either one of these installment land contract or the option, then we're going to get an attorney to draft. So the option is our unilateral, meaning only one side has to perform. How about goats? I like goats. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> the other alternative method we have is something called a preemptive right. Now, before we look at our examples of preemptive right, let's first talk about what a preemptive right is. A preemptive right is a contractual agreement. You are contractually obligated to sell your property to somebody first. We have an agreement that says, maybe you don't wanna sell right now. Maybe I don't wanna buy right now. But if we have a preemptive right and you decide to sell, we are contractually, you are contractually obligated to come to me. So we got two different preemptive rights. The first one is the right of first refusal. We've not decided a purchase price. We just know the owner doesn't want to sell right now, but you want to buy. And with the right of first refusal, the owner is obligated, if they ever get an offer, they're obligated to come to you and give you the opportunity to match or beat that offer. I think where we see this most might be in um, leases, tenant situations. It might be that the tenant wants to buy, but the landlord doesn't want to sell just yet. Why would they? They're making good rent. They're making good money every month, right? But somewhere down the road, the owner may decide to sell. And when they do, once they get an offer in their hand, they're contractually obligated to go to that party first and have them match. Uh, bona fide means legit, means you got an offer in your hand. Attorneys are involved here as well. The other one is the right of first opportunity to purchase. Again, the seller doesn't want to sell just yet, but if they do decide to sell, they got to go to that contracting party. We have uh, agreed on a price in most cases, right of first opportunity to purchase. Uh, somebody asked about the details of the offer. Yeah, and we got to share the details of the offer, which is like I said, we got attorneys involved to make sure that everything's, because how can you match it if you don't know what it is, right? So this is kind of kind of a little bit of the exception, but again, we got, because I don't have pre-printed forms for these. So we've got attorneys involved that'll help us handle it. And when you make the offer, you know, I can't respond to this because I got a preemptive right. I'm contractually obligated to go to somebody else first. How does agency work in this case? Same as it always does. We got attorneys. Attorneys are here to assist us to make sure we're, we're handling it. Because I, I have bumps on us, right? Because we just said you can't show the terms of the offer. But with the right of first, or, or yeah, right of first refusal, you have to. So how do we do that? 
attorneys. If I were to do a nice side-by-side -side comparison here, the difference in the two, and again, don't get bogged down on these. Contracting right of first refusal, contracting party has to batch a bona fide offer. Right of first opportunity to purchase, the sales price already been decided. So when the seller decides to sell, which one are we going to do? Well, it could depend on the situation. It could depend on the parties. Again, attorneys can help us sort through that. Let's say you live next door to the corner uh, vacant lot. And you really don't want to buy the corner vacant lot because you have no need for it. But you also don't want Dollar General to buy the corner vacant lot. You may want to consider a preemptive right. For example, several different scenarios where we might see that. What are my Winston-Salem people? My Winston-Salem people, you guys know, well, of course, Old Salem. You know, people like live in Old Salem, right? Those, all those houses and everything. Oh, they're gorgeous inside. Outside, they look like Old Salem, but inside they're, they're gorgeous. Um, Old Salem Inc. has a preemptive right. So if you ever make an offer, if you're ever helping a buyer buy in Old Salem, and they'll have instructions on how you proceed. They're not going to let you try to figure it out on your own. They will have instructions on how to proceed. So again, you guys, I would make a note right now. These alternative land conveyance methods, honestly, I would just put this in your review at the end of the class. Because as you guys are coming back and reviewing 7, 8, 9, and 10, these alternative land methods is not where we need to spend our time. So just make a note, come back and review, get yourself a, you know, a test question or two, but not much more than that. And speaking of seven, eight, nine, and 10. We did it. Unit 10, those key terms are back on page 271. Key point review is 314. Student quiz on 316. As we said after seven and eight, you guys, we are done with contract, contract law. I need you guys to keep going back and reviewing. You saw lots of red stars. We keep moving forward though. I'm telling you, if you put this stuff down until the 1st of March, you're gonna be starting all over. So make, even if it's just 20 minutes in your study time to go back and review the key terms, seven, eight, nine, and 10, keep this stuff fresh. Don't forget our YouTube channel as well. I'm such a fan of the power of repetition. If you hear it again and again and again and again, things start clicking. Listen to it in your car, earbuds at work. If your boss allows, I don't want to get you in trouble at work. Wherever. Questions? Let's take 10, we come back, we're gonna talk about other things we have to talk about tonight.
cameras are on. I'm going to take attendance. All right. Couple announcements. First off, my old book people, or I should say non-current book people. Uh, I mentioned the other day, there's a couple pages in the new book that you don't have in your old book. So if you're not the same version of the book that I am, I've loaded these into the online learning system. I'm in the Julie folder and we're way down here at the bottom. There's a couple pages from unit 10. Specific in here is going to be um, about the earnest money deposit. That's what you don't have in your book. We'll look at, there's a couple things from unit 15 as well. So we'll look at that. So the Julie folder and the online learning system, if you're not in the current version of the book, uh, remember we talked about those pages that kind of go over the terms and the provisions of the offer to purchase and contract. So I wanted to make sure you got those. So there they are. Good with that. Check. Another announcement I have, make sure everybody's back, make sure I can see you. We have, or you have, uh, a cram course scheduled on uh, March 8th. We asked you to pencil it in on day one. Uh, they had to change the time. So the cram course is still going to be on March 8th. Please note the new time. It's 11.30 to 3.30. Uh, Dr. Bowser is going to do the cram course with you guys. The day before, like March 7th, Lane will email you Jane's Zoom link. We're not going to send it to you sooner because you got a better chance of losing it. So Lane will email you Jane's Zoom link the day before. Uh, right now, just note the time change. Now 11.30 to 3.30. I don't know if Jane records. That's a common question I get. Does Jane record? I don't know. But what I do know in the online learning system, there's a folder called CRAM. And if you're unable to attend, there's a recording loaded there. So if for some reason you can't come on that date, I already forgot what it was. Was that the eight? I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> Short term memory. But if you can't come, then the CRAM course, there's a recording in the CRAM folder. Uh, and also, while we're on dates, don't forget our exam is March 9th. That's a Saturday. We figured, gosh, evening classes are tough. Could y'all imagine getting off work and logging on and taking a four-hour test? So we're going to do it on Saturday morning. Um, again, more details on that to come. And the other date, please make sure you have March 16th in your calendar. That's the retake. If you're eligible for the retake, that is the retake date. Um, to be eligible for the retake, you didn't pass, but you made at least a 50%. So just make sure you have these dates, questions on these dates and our tentative schedule in the Julie folder. And the 16th is the retake for what the um, actual, the final? Yes. Okay. If you don't, if you don't pass, but you at least make a 50%, you're eligible for the retake exam. Mm -hmm. We give you a free second chance. How many times in life can you say that? We give you a free second chance. So there you go. Anything else about our dates? What was that? I have a question. So yeah. our final exam is going to be online? Yes. So you guys log into Zoom like you always do. Once we get you logged in, then I will give you a, um, a Zoom link. Or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, an exam link. Uh, what time is the exam on the 9th? 9 to 1, our normal class time. No, we're not in a morning class, are we? <laughs> I'm used to, <laughs> I'm getting all these looks. Is it not morning? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll make a note of that. Uh, the exam on the ninth is nine to one. I will make a note of that. I will change that and update that this weekend. The retake is is there. It's nine fifteen to one fifteen. 
that one I got for you. <laughs> the other one, I, my little brain, y'all, I tell you. Other questions on these dates. By the way, when you guys log on, it's all I have in me not to say good morning because that's just my habit. That's just what I'm used to. Another announcement. Um, Is there another time that we can take the final exam? I, I can't answer that. You need to reach out to Lane. And I would do it sooner rather than later. Just because that would be 6 a.m. for me. And that's kind of early. I, I would reach out to Lane, discuss with her. Um, No, you guys don't have to go to a building to take my test. You will go to a building to take your state exam. So my test, because you guys are all over, you guys are all over the state. So for my test, like I said, you guys log on to Zoom like you always do. And then we'll put the link to the exam in the chat and you sit there in the comfort of your own home, take the exam, we proctor you on Zoom. Um, this is a good place for me to stop and say, when you take my end of class exam on March 9th, I need you all to be in a distraction free zone. If there's anybody in that room with you talking to you, I can only presume you're talking about the exam. And if you're talking about the exam, that's cheating. So I get, you got about a month to secure a distraction free zone. Is everybody good with that? I got two um, spouses, <laughs> I actually got two couples in this class, so I need you guys in different parts of the house. I can't have you in the same in the same room. So again, just kind of, and uh, your state exam, I'm getting questions about the state exam. Hang on, I'm getting there in just one second. This is just our end of class exam. So distraction-free zone. It concerns me, you guys. If I were to unmute all right now, I know I would hear a lot going on in the background. So please just for your exams, we can't have it. We cannot have it. Before we talk about your state exam, now that we're done with unit 10, we have a midterm. So what I wanna do is go back and refresh, make sure we good. Y'all remember day one? Seemed like so long ago, doesn't it? And day one, we talked about, so what do we have to do? Bottom line, how do I become a real estate broker? Well, the first step is to get your certificate of completion from a pre-licensing class and from Carolina School of Real Estate. To get your certificate of completion, you must meet three criteria. You have to meet your attendance requirements. Everybody remember your minimum hours. If you go over 15 hours, you're not eligible for the exam, thus you're not eligible for your certificate of completion. You have to pass the end of class exam with a 75%. And in addition to that, to get your certificate of completion, you have to take the midterm. Now, please, let's talk about this. Does that say pass the midterm? No, that says take the midterm. What I'm telling you is for you to get credit for the midterm, you've got to try it. You've got to try. I've got to have a completed midterm for you guys in order for you to be eligible for the end of class exam. So before we show you where to access the midterm, I need to make sure everybody is hearing me. What happens if you don't attempt the midterm? You can't move on. You don't on. pass the class, yeah. That's it, you're done, aren't you? So is everybody, do I have everybody's attention that get it? I need you to attempt it. And guys, quite frankly, I think you should treat this midterm as if it were the real test. The midterm is gonna be in units 10 through, no, two through 10, units two through 10. And you may have a question or two from um, 20, which was our super scary environmental unit. So two through 10 and 20, the things that we've talked about so far. I need you to attempt it. I'm not looking for pass or fail. I'm looking for a completed result. I encourage you to take it seriously. I encourage you to treat it like a real test because hopefully my objective with this midterm 
is that it's your it's your halfway checkpoint. And if you're treating this like a real exam, ask yourself, if I were sitting down right now and taking Julie's end of class exam, would I pass? So with this midterm, still in the online learning system, if we come up to the 50% material, under unit 10, you got 50% material, and then we have our own tab. There's a midterm exam, Julie only. Please make sure the one you click on is Julie only. You're not in Nancy's class, you're not in Ann's class. Whose class are you in? Julie's. So Julie only. Failure to complete the midterm will result in you not being eligible to take the final exam. If you don't take the midterm, game over. Do I have any questions on that? Is that clear? I mean, the midterm date and time will be provided in just a second. Your score does not matter, but you must take it. You get one shot and you get one sitting. I suggest, I think it's, I think it's two hours. I suggest putting yourself in a distraction-free zone and allowing yourself two hours to take the midterm. Once you finish, we will both get your results emailed to us. Part of your results is gonna be a breakdown of topics. So it'll tell you, this is how many you missed on agency, this is how many you missed on zoning, this is how many you missed on contracts. We're not gonna let you review the questions because quite frankly, you're not gonna see those questions again. But what you do need to know is your areas of weakness. What you do need to know is you bombed agency, for example, so you know what to go back and focus on. Your midterm, 50% reviews, everybody see this? 50% review, online learning system, Julie folder. Your midterm will go live at 12.05 tonight. So at 12.05, Friday morning, your midterm will go live and it'll stay live through 11.55 p.m. next Thursday. You guys get a whole week. Can you give me two hours in a week? Perfect. So it goes live tonight, 12.05 a.m. And it stays live until 11.55 next Thursday night. I don't want to see any midterm results come in while we're in class next Tuesday or Thursday night. I would consider that a distraction and I would have a hard time figuring out how to give you class credit time because I know you're not paying attention in class. I know you're doing the midterm. So you have a week, but I don't want you doing it while we're in class. Like I said, we're moving on to more testable material. So the midterm is an out of class thing. Questions on the midterm. By the way, before you ask, I'm sorry, before you ask, the, the midterm, the class marker is the program that provides your midterm. That's also the program that your end of course exam will be delivered on. So the midterm is going to serve two purposes. It's going to, again, serve as a checkpoint where you are right now, but it's also going to allow you to navigate the system that you're going to take your end of class exam on. Um, if I go back, that email you guys got from Lane that you use every day to access class, Within that email is a tutorial on class marker. So before you take your midterm, you may want to go watch that tutorial. I can't tell you how long it is, but again, it shows you how to navigate the system, how you can go back and forth, how you can bookmark a question, how you can maneuver around. Um, there's a link that says, see all questions. And when you click on that, it'll tell you everything that's answered or unanswered. So you definitely, before you submit it, you want to make sure everything is answered. So this, again, kind of serves twofold. One, make sure we're a checkpoint, uh, but then two, allows you to get familiar with and navigate around class marker. So we are, yep. So we are in the 50% material. Here's unit 10. 
50%. There's a couple extra quizzes there for you guys. And then you guys are going to do class marker midterm exam, Julie only. Now, questions on the midterm. Probably the number one question I get from the midterm outside of class is, how long do we have? So here it is again. Starts tomorrow. If you want to set your alarm for midnight, <laughs> get up and stretch. You can knock it out at 12.05. I'll be sleeping. I won't get your results. But you have until next Thursday at 11.55 p.m. How many questions? I think 55. No math. No math on the midterm. <laughs> Best news all day, hey? <laughs> but yeah. And again, the, the, the benefit of the midterm is the report you get afterwards. Because it gives you the breakdown. Two through 10 and 20, the material we've covered so far. Of course. Sure, sure, I just got a request to leave the Zoom open. I think there's 55 questions. Remind me to leave the Zoom call open, please. And the study group is not taking the midterm together. I don't think that would benefit you. But yeah, I'm happy to leave it open anytime, but you may need to remind me. We are all doing a midterm review um, awesome. Saturday night. And if anybody wants to join, you can send me your phone number at the end of class. Perfect. Uh, can you start and stop, or do you have to complete it all in one sitting? You get one shot. You got to do it all in one sitting. Don't forget about it. I'll be able to remind you guys Tuesday. I guess I'll be able to remind you Thursday, too. But if you're waiting until Thursday after class, it's like, what, 930, 1030, 1130. So you're pretty much logging out of class and logging right on to the midterm. I just made myself tired thinking about doing that. So I don't recommend that, but you guys know what's best for you. I don't care, just get it done. Anything else on the midterm? that would be an absolute correct assumption. No notes, no books, because again, ideally we're treating this as a real test. We're treating this as a real exam. And in the real exam, mine and your state exam, no books, no notes. So Julie, we can teach. have scrap paper, correct? Like yes. just a piece of scrap paper, okay. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yep. Do I teach post licensing? Yes, I do. I do what Lane tells me to. It's just easier that way. <laughs> okay. The next big thing. I know now more about our new testing ven vendor. So we are at a place that we can talk about the application process. Now I wanna go up here for just a second um, on my learning system and I'm up in the welcome section. And there's this booklet you guys have, real estate licensing in North Carolina. You know, by now we like to make an acronym out of everything, right? So we call this our Relink book, real estate licensing in North Carolina. They're not gonna update this book until March 1st, 2024. 
So right now, all we still have to go on is the current version, which is fine because the primary change is the venue and the changes are actually, they're good. I'm, I'm excited. The good news for you guys is you don't know no different. It's all new to you. You don't know the old versus the new. So we, the application process, how to apply for your license hasn't changed. So we can still go ahead and have this conversation tonight, which I want to. Um, and then once we get this new relink book in March of 2020 or March 1st of this year, then we'll be able to share with you guys. But you cannot submit your application until you pass this exam on March 9th. So we still have plenty of time to get you the new book. I leave it here for a reference because other than venue information, it, it's all, there's a few other slight changes, but nothing to get too excited about. The application process itself hasn't changed. So there's the good news. Um, this booklet kind of answers the question. Yay, I passed Julie's end of class exam. Now what do I do? And this booklet is where it helps you get through that process. And hear me when I say, you guys, it is a process, the application piece, the application process. Understand, too, once you get your certificate of completion from finishing this class, you leave the hands of Carolina School of Real Estate and you go into the hands of the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. So you'll be dealing with this booklet, their information. I have updated uh, my slides down here in the Julie section. So again, we have the slides that we're getting ready to look at that kind of shows you the step-by-step -step process. Um, again, and we'll talk about the venue changes when they release the new book on March 1st. So mm -hmm. let's talk about this application process. I know some of you are um, anxious to get started. I know some of you are ready to um, Knock out your application, get your state exam, exam done, get your license, and start practicing real estate. Others of you may want to wait until you finish this class before you start the application process. There's no wrong way to do that. Some of you are more eager than others, so you know, you know what's best for you. And let's see, I got some other questions. Uh, once we pass this exam and the class is over, will we still have access to the online learning system? Of course. Of course, we want you guys to pass. Remember, my job is to prepare you for the state exam. So whatever tools we have offer for you now, you guys will still have access to the online learning system for four months after this class. If you need it longer than four months, just reach out to Lane. She's not a mind reader. So if you want it for more than four months, just reach out to her and she'll extend your, your access. Um... How long can we access all of this after our exams at the online learning system? Yeah, four months. Okay. So the Relink book, the current Relink book, again, um, I'm everybody please bear with me. I promise. Hang on. Hang on. Guys, understand this conversation is just about your state exam. This is not about our end of class exam. Please don't ask me questions about your end of class exam. We just need to stay focused and just stop asking questions because all these questions that are coming in, I got answers for you, I promise. But you got to let me talk. Everybody good? Give me just a minute. Okay, so the Relink book goes over a couple things other than the application process. One of the things that it does is reminds us who needs a license in North Carolina. Now, we saw this in Unit 8. We talked about L.L. Beans, the... Uh, Transfer of real property, by the transfer of real property, we're referring to list, lease, buy, exchange, auction, negotiate, and sell. Go back to unit eight. The transfer of real property for others for compensation. And in North Carolina, when you're doing all three activities, a license is required. In North Carolina, we are all brokers. North Carolina is a brokerage state. Some states you become a sales associate first and then you graduate to becoming a broker. Think of the sales associate as getting your bachelor's degree. The broker is getting your master's degree. 
North Carolina, we skip that sales associate nonsense and we launch you right into your master's degree. That's why this is so intense. You're getting a master's degree in real estate in a very short amount of time. So we're all brokers. What differentiates us are the different license categories. So you guys are soon to be you guys, my PBs, you're at entry level status. You're brokers with training wheels. Once you pass a state exam, you are issued a license on provisional status and it is inactive. Meaning on an inactive license, you cannot practice real estate. Who can remind me as a provisional broker how you activate your license? You got to join a firm. Join a firm. That's right. You got to join a firm. You got to be under the supervision of a broker in charge. And once you're under the supervision of a broker in charge as a PB, you can do just about everything that a full broker can do. So you're on provisional status, meaning you cannot operate unless you're under the direct vision of a broker in charge. Who can remind me how you drop that provisional status? C, 90 more hours. Not CE, close, but 90 more hours of- Post-licensing. 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 Oh, post -licensing. Yep, yep, I know, close, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know, post-licensing. There are three 30-hour post-licensing classes Completing post, maybe you do it within your first six weeks. Maybe you do it, how long do we have to do post while we're at it? 18 months. 18, 18, months. 18, months. 18 months. So maybe you do it your first six weeks. Maybe you wait until month 14. There's no wrong way to do it. Just make sure you get it done, those 90 hours done within those 18 months. Once you complete those 90 hours, you drop your provisional status and you're just a broker also known as a full broker, also known as a non-provisional broker. Are there exams for post-licensing? Yes, you gotta pass. You gotta complete all three post-classes. There are exams, everybody breathe. Post-licensing is not near as intense as pre. But with that being said, you still have to pass these exams in post-licensing. So we need you to be committed. We need you to do the recommended reading or studying, whatever the instructor gives, uh, so you can get through the post-licensing exams. There's 90 hours, you drop the provisional status, you're just a broker. Brokers may choose to affiliate with a firm. They may choose to go on their own. We're gonna talk more about that when we get into um, license law and commission rule. Once you're a broker, and you get some experience under your belt, at some point in your career, you may wanna become the BIC. The BIC is another license category. We're gonna talk more about the BIC, what those requirements are when we get to our license law and commission rule. And I also think it's important that we understand that the firm has to have a license as well. So we are gonna talk about renewing your license when the individual is renewing, the firm has to renew as well. And the firm's license could also be subject to disciplinary action, depending on how they handle. So the firms are under, the firm through the Real Estate Commission's eyes are seen just as just like the broker. We all have to follow the same rules of license law and commission rule. So the different categories, um, the qualifications to get a license, you gotta be 18 years old. Some of you may be in this class right now that are 17, have had it happen. You cannot submit your application until your 18th birthday. So you got to be 18 years old, U.S. citizen, Social Security number. You have to satisfy the education requirements. What are the education requirements? Certificate of completion from this class. You got to submit your application, which we're talking about the application process. You got to pass a state exam, which we were talking about. And then you got to prove to the commission that you have the requisite character for licensure. So your application is going to ask you some character issues. We'll talk about that as well. So let's talk first about the application process. And again, you guys, please hear me. This is a process. 
And we got to go in order. There are steps and we can't skip steps. Step one, complete this course and get your certificate of completion from Lane or any pre-licensing class, school. Your certificate of completion is good for three years. Once you pass this class, you have three years to pass your state exam and get your license. Please, please do not wait three years. You are always going to be tested on the current. So if the information updates, which it will, between now and three years from now, something will change. I don't know what, but something will change. You're always going to be tested on the current. Your certificate of completion is good for three years. Once you get your certificate of completion from Lane on March 9th, you can submit your application. Now I'm gonna go in just a second to the Real Estate Commission's website and show you where you can get started. All of you could get started on it today if you wanted to, not during class, but all of you could get started because you cannot submit it until you complete. But you can start it, save it, create an account, log back in, I do encourage you guys to at least go check it out because they're gonna want information from you guys like um, addresses for the past seven years, for example. So you may need to gather some information. But again, I'll show you in just a second where you can start your application. Once you submit your application, the Real Estate Commission staff will process your application. If, um, information is missing, if it's incomplete, they're gonna send it back to you. So once they process it, they verify that it's complete, then they send your information to the testing center and they will notify you. You will get what's referred to as a notice of exam eligibility. You cannot go to the testing center without a notice of exam eligibility. Let's think of this as your golden ticket into the testing center. Because until you get this notice of exam eligibility, the testing center has no clue that you exist. So if you call them, they've never heard of you until you get that notice of exam eligibility. So give them five to seven days, they say to process, they will email you a notice of exam eligibility. That is your golden ticket to contact the testing center to schedule your date. I had a question earlier. When do we take our state exam? That's entirely up to you. You have three years from March 9th to go through the process. Pearson View is the new venue. They have locations all over the state. I know somebody asked me about that a few minutes ago, too. Again, you guys don't know no better. I know this, but I was blown away. Our current testing center has eight centers across the state of North Carolina. The new one has 68. So it's really safe to say wherever you are, there's a testing center awfully close by. Um, they have some company owned. They also have some, some uh, uh, partner locations that will work with them and allow you tests. So definitely huge change there. I was very excited to hear that. So you guys have some options. And again, we'll look at those options when they release the new book. There's one on Stratford Road in uh, Winston-Salem. That's the current. Yeah, that's, that's going that, to that's that. gonna change. Okay. That changes on March 1st. Well, no, 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 no. I know what you're saying. Pearson View. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do have one. The current is also on off of Stratford. Um, so you're just coming down the road a bit. So you contact the testing center. You go take your state exam. The next step on the application process, you pass. Yay! Once you pass both sections, national and state section, I'll talk more about that, 
Once you pass both sections, um, the commission finalizes your application. If they have any questions, again, character concerns, anything like that, they'll reach out to you. If they have no issues, once you pass, you can expect about seven to 10 business days and they will mail you your brand new real estate license. Comes in a nice manila envelope. It's a good day to walk out to the mailbox. Let me tell you what. You guys get that license? I suggest going to Hobby Lobby and getting yourself a frame and displaying it proudly. Because you know what, y'all? I worked hard for this thing. <laughs> you know what I see when I walk into my office? The first thing I see, I see this. And right next to it is my college degree. Because that's what I worked hard for. So go to Hobby Lobby and get you a frame. If it's not on sale this week, it will be next. That's the fun about Hobby Lobby, you know? So they're going to actually mail you a real estate license. If you don't pass, it's okay. It is okay. Your application is good for 180 days. You have 180 days to pass both sections. Again, more on that in just a second. So if you don't pass, you got to pass both sections. So if you go on the test day and you pass a section and you fail a section, the good news is, is you only have to retake the section that you failed. As long as you can get it both done within 180 days. If that 180 day window closes, you got to resubmit your application and you got to take both sections. So I tell you guys, don't submit that application until you're ready. Because once you get your notice of exam eligibility, your 180 day clock starts. And a lot of times what you guys do is submit your application, get your notice and then say, well, I'll wait a couple months before I go. You you're killing time. So don't submit it until you're ready. Does everybody hear me? So you have the full, so you have the best of that six months. Guys, there are no allowable excuses to get an extension on that 180 days. If you go past the 180 days, you start over with the application process. You don't have to retake pre-licensing until your certificate of completion runs out. How good is your certificate of completion good for? Three years. Do not wait three years. When I see you guys again, I want it to be in post-licensing. I don't want to see you in three years from now because you never made it to the state exam. Fair? So there's a step-by-step. -step. Again, and pages down here in the bottom are from the your Relink book. So you can reference. By the way, something else I learned in our meeting yesterday. How many of you looked at that Relink book? I know Lane sent it to you when you registered. And she emailed it and she asked you guys to look it over. I found out yesterday when you submit your application, you have to check a box saying you've read it. So, ooh, I like that. Some of the questions I've gotten in the past, some of the questions that the commission gets proves otherwise. <laughs> but remember, you've checked a box saying you've read it. Part of your application, and again, I'll show you in a second where you can start all this. Part of your application, you're required to order a criminal record report. They will only take your criminal record report from one company. That company is part of the application process. You can access them straight through um, the application to the process. Your criminal record report is good for six months. So again, you may wanna wait, if you're ready to go, you may wanna wait a few weeks to order that background because there's nothing you can do until you pass on March 9th. Is everybody good with that? There's nothing you can do. So don't order your background check now because then you've just killed a couple weeks of time. So I would wait closer to the end of February 1st of March. The character consideration that we talked about, they're looking for criminal offenses. Um, if you've had any kind of disciplinary action with another professional license, another occupational license, uh, maybe CNA, CPA, for example, 
Uh, any outstanding liens or unpaid judgments? Again, these are things that they may call you and ask questions on. I'm not saying you won't get a license. I'm saying they just may call and ask for clarification. They may call and ask for more information. If you do have blemishes on your past, if you do have previous criminal offenses and you're concerned about whether or not they'll consider that for a license, you can ask the commission for what's referred to as a petition for predetermination. Please do not call Lane and I and tell us what you did. <laughs> we can't, yep, <laughs> we can't answer these questions. So if you have a criminal background, I'm not saying you will get a license or maybe you won't, it depends. But what you can do, pages 11 through 13 in your Relink book, you can go through the process for a petition for predetermination. And what that is, is they will say, based on your criminal offenses, nothing else, based only on your criminal offenses, will that prohibit you from getting a license? Question comes in, is there a limit to how many fails you have? Nope, you can go as many times as you can get in within those 180 days. They do make you wait 10 days in between, but you could schedule like today for day 10. So however many times you can get in. Questions on the character issues. I'm getting there, I promise. I got a question about the background check. We're not waiting on the background check before we submit the application. It's all going at once. You got to give it time. That's a good question. Thank you. You got to give it time to get back. And how long it takes really depends on where you've lived the last seven to 10 years. So if you've lived just in North Carolina for seven to 10 years, then you can get it back pretty quickly. But if they have to go to other states or other countries, then you need to allow for longer to get it back. And I can't tell you how long each state takes. Uh, there's going to be additional charges for the all the states if you've moved around a lot, again, different countries. And I can't tell you what each state costs. But yes, before you submit your application, you have to have that background check back. I just don't think you guys want to order it today because if you get it back next week, it's going to sit there for three or four weeks before you finish this class. So again, will, we, see... will we receive an email saying that it's back or? Oh yeah, absolutely. Can... Okay, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They, the reeling book specifically calls out New York. They say New York is notorious for taking their sweet time getting back. So if you have, if you've lived in New York the last seven to 10 years, you may want to, I don't know why they called them out. <laughs> I guess that's their reputation. So we've gotten our notice of exam eligibility. We're ready to apply. And remember, you cannot, you submit your application and then you wait. This is where Elaine and I get the most phone calls. I've submitted my application, but I haven't heard anything from the Real Estate Commission. Five to seven business days, you guys, to get your notice of exam eligibility. So you got to be patient. You submit it. You'll get verification that you submitted it. And then you wait. Once you get your notice of exam eligibility, then you can contact the venue. Like we said, that notice of exam eligibility is good for 180 days. If you don't pass both sections within 180 days, you submit a new application. You start over on step two. Remember, we are all in the throes of step one. So if you're not ready to go, please don't submit your application. They get calls on the regular there's nothing they can do to extend that time. So if you don't have both sections complete within 180 days, you go back to step two, you submit your application and you got to order a new background check. Don't submit it until you're ready. I'm getting a lot of questions about costs. Yes, there are costs. Every time you go to the testing center, there's a $100 application fee. Plus, if you have to take both sections, it's $60. 
If it's just one section, it's 50. You get a little bit of a break if you're only going after one. So let's say you go to the testing center the first time, you pay $160. You pass one section and you fail a section, which means you have to go back to the testing center. And when you go back for one section, it's $150. $100 every time. I'm trying to save your pocketbook. Don't go unless you're ready. Can we see how this can add up? Sometimes, sometimes you guys say, well, I just want to go see what it's about. I'm not ready. I just want to go see what it's about. So now you've wasted $160 plus that 180 days. Background check costs money. Have a plan. So either 160 bucks or 150 bucks every single time you go. Exam questions. There are 80 questions on the national, 80 testable questions on the national. There are 60 testable questions on the state. This is new to your current relink book. This is the new. To pass each section, you need a 75% on both sections. Both sections also have pre-test questions what I call test the test questions. You're gonna have five questions that don't count for or against you. You have no idea that they're real or test the test. What you're doing is vetting these, te these test questions for future test takers. Do you know what past test takers did for you guys? They vetted these questions. So what we're telling you, these questions on the state exam, They've been vetted. They've been through actual test taking candidates. So these five pre-test questions don't count for or against you. Only 80 on the national, 60 on the state. To pass both sections, both passing scores, 75%. Questions on this? They did increase the state. It was 40 questions and now it's 60. And quite frankly, they did it for you guys because now you can miss more. The way it's weighted, you can get more wrong now because you have more chance. So I think this is good for you guys. And I think they also increased it too because the state specific section is so important because what state are we in? We need to know about the state that we're working. But yeah, the good news is, is you can miss more they also increased your time on the state section too. We'll see that in just a second. So you use your T-bar. Rate or percent goes in the bottom right. <laughs> the total number of questions goes in the bottom of left. So there's what you need to pass. If you're seeing the T-bar in real world, everyday world, <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> um, when you are submitting your application, when you're applying, if any of you have disabilities through the American with Disability Act, um, the testing centers will work with you, special accommodations. Please make a note, page 25 in the relink book. And of course, when we get the revised, we'll look at it. But within the relink book, they have specific instructions. If any of you need special accommodations, again, please don't call Lane or I. All we can do is have you uh, follow the instructions in the Relink book and reach out to uh, the testing center. Once you schedule your exam, they ask that you come 30 minutes early to get checked in. Um, they do require ID. The list of approved ID is in the relink book. And they will also send it with your um, confirmation that you're scheduled. So they'll let you know what type of ID to bring. 
what is acceptable, of course, driver's license, any other forms of ID. Please take it. Y'all, I had a student a couple months ago, forgot her license. So how in the world do you forget your license? She had, she, She'd been to Vegas the weekend before and she hadn't transferred over her party purse to her everyday purse and her driver's license didn't make it. She went to the testing center with no ID. Remember what I just said, you guys, they charge you every time you walk in the door. She didn't get to test that day and they had to bill her again to reschedule. She was so upset. Learn from her lesson. Make sure your ID is in your pocket before you go, please. She was so upset, poor thing. I recommend when you guys go, again, I don't know the new ven venue all that well, but just my experience, what I do know, when you guys go, I would take in as little personal things as what you can. Ladies, if you can leave your pocketbook at home or in the trunk, um, they're probably going to make you clear out your pockets. Um, I don't know specifics. They're not quite patting you guys down yet, um, but they're going to make sure that they, you, you know, you don't have a big stack of, you know, cards or something in, in your pocket. So my suggestion is to go with as little. And once you get your confirmation email, I'm sure they'll discuss that with you further. Uh, we got to we got to protect the integrity of the exam. Exam security is a big issue. Anybody want to take a guess on what the biggest problem the real estate commission has with their state exam? One of the biggest problems? I would think she did. Oh. Yeah. Don't do it. Seriously, you guys, if you take all that energy and figure out how to cheat and put it into studying, you'll do just fine. What do you think they're going to think about your character if they catch you cheating on your state exam? You would cheat the public. <laughs> That's exactly it, that you're going to cheat the public. They're not going to take too kindly to that, are they? So let's just don't do it. Let's just don't do it. Uh, state questions in the book scattered all throughout. Left-hand margin, it says, in North Carolina. There's also a license law and commission rule in Appendix A. So you're there. You've checked in. It is on computer. Mm -hmm. They will monitor you. Mm -hmm. They sit in a little room above you or probably near you somewhere to watch you. Make sure you're not. Before we go to break, there was a guy caught once. He wore shorts and he had some stuff, maybe some formulas or something written on the top of his thigh. And they watched him looking down. And they said, what are you looking at? He had stuff written on his leg. Don't, don't do it. I don't know. I'd have, I've been sweating so bad. I'd have blue ink running down my leg or something, you know, but seriously, it takes more effort to cheat than it does. It's not worth it. So we're not going to do it. We need to take a break. Let's take 10. We come back. I got more to say about the relink book. Hey, Julie, on the NCLEX, they make you pull your hair up. They like if you got a hoodie on, you got to take it off and empty your pockets. It's a lot with the in class and you got to do your fingerprints. <laughs> yep. We don't do fingerprints yet, but I've heard like if you're wearing glasses, they'll make them like look on the arm on the inside. I don't even know how you would see something written in there. But yeah, they're they're not just going to let you walk in off the street. They're going to like I said, they're not patting you down yet, <laughs> right. you know, but they are going to probably ask you to clear your pockets out. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Okay. We are working through the process to get you. I wasn't kidding when I said it's a process. And that's why we have you the book um, so you can refer to it. Um, I'm excited about the new book that's coming out on March 1st. Apparently there's video tutorials link embedded in it somehow. So if you're looking at it online, you can watch a video too, kind of walk you through the process. So that's kind of cool. And remember too, we're recording. Um, so whenever that book releases, we'll have to just go back through that real quick. But still talking about the process. Let me take attendance. Just a little bit more to say. Um, we've already said we're not going to cheat. Just don't do it. Not worth it. The other thing is that each section is timed. So you get two and a half hours for the national section. You get two hours for the state. Once your clock starts for each section, it doesn't stop. However, you do get a break in between both session, sections. So I recommend holding your break in between the national and the state, giving yourself a minute to get up, clear your mind, run to the restroom. Again, if you run to the restroom in the throes of a section, your clock keeps ticking. They also offer, before you start, they used to, I don't know, I'm assuming, I'm assuming they still will, but the, the new venue, I'm assuming they'll offer you like a tutorial on the program that doesn't count for your time. So you can kind of walk through, yes, the two hours is new for the state. I've updated my slides uh, this morning. <laughs> That's what I did. So what you're seeing is what's is what's current. Uh, but yeah, if you if they do give you the option to watch the tutorial, it doesn't count against your time. And I would definitely take advantage of that so you can um, learn how to navigate the system and save yourself some test time there. So like we said, when you pass, celebrate. This is when the big celebration comes in. You know, we're going to do the mini celebrations, but this is this is the big one. So you pass, give them, you know, they're going to review everything, check those character issues, dot the I's and cross the T's. If they have any questions or if they want further information, they'll reach out to you all through the application account uh, that I'm getting ready to show you guys where you can get it started. So that's how they'll communicate with you. Um, then give them, what did they say? I think I think seven to 10 business days to mail you, to mail you your license. And again, you guys, if you don't pass a section the first time, it's okay. I have long said that these exams are in no way any kind of indicator of what kind of real estate agent you're going to be. I don't know. It doesn't mean anything. All it knows is that you can pass the information. I have known plenty of agents over my years that have had to go back and test two, three I know a top producer today, he said he had to go to the state exam eight times. You know what that says to me? If this is something you really, really want, you will do whatever it takes to get it. And like I said, today he's a top producer. He's out there kicking butt and taking names. He just had to get through the test. I don't mind sharing with you guys. The first time I went to the testing center, I failed. And that was a bad day. That was a bad day. I called mom because, you know, right there you hit submit and it says, are you sure? And it says, bam, pass or fail. I got in the parking lot, called mom, all, -oo 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 -oo, you know, and mom, you know, mom, maybe you did better than you think you did. Like, I already know. You know, it was a bad day. I had my little cry fest, woke up the next day, dusted myself off. And voila, here we are. Please do not let this, um, no indication. No indication whatsoever. It's okay. Breathe. Get back at it. Also from the state exam, you'll get a report that'll tell you the topics. So you know your areas of weakness, which quite frankly, by the time you get to the state exam, you know your areas of weakness anyway. Um, but they'll they'll give you their little chart so you know what you can uh, what you can study. What questions do I have? just on your state exam. Besides where you find it. So as soon as you, like you said, so as soon as you finish both parts, oh, when it, so as soon as you finish like one part, it'll say 
pass or fail or when you finish the whole thing? When, if you're taking both parts, I'll wait till the end to tell you. I, I believe. I believe they'll wait to the end. Do you pay cash for the exam? Nope, it's all done online. See, when I got I got my license in 08, we didn't have this two section stuff. It was all one test. It was a pass or fail. So this two section stuff is new. 08, yeah, that's when I got mine. So you get an email, cool. So let me show you guys where you can find this information. Let me introduce you officially to the Real Estate Commission's website, ncrec.gov, or you can just go to Google, start typing in North Carolina Real Estate Commission. It's bound to come up. I'm going to point out a couple of things. I think I know the commission's website is a great resource, especially once you get licensed. I know when you guys get licensed that you're like, you're like in a hurry to get there and then you get licensed. Like, well, now what do I do? So I think the commission's website is a great resource. Um, remember their number one purpose is to protect the public. So anything they offer here to help educate the public, we're welcome to use as well. So there's lots of good stuff on here, but before we look, and we're not gonna spend all our study time on this, but I do think it's a good tool for you guys to have and be aware of. Um, I know in my post-licensing classes, I spend a little bit more time on here because once you leave pre and post, we're not handing you the information anymore. So you guys need to know where to find it for your everyday business. But if we go to ncrec.gov, I'm on the home page. And I'm going to scroll down almost the whole way to the bottom. And there's a big link right there that says apply for a license. It's where it all starts. ncrec.gov homepage, apply for a license. There is nothing stopping any of you from clicking on that button. Like I said, you can start it, save your information and come back to it if you don't know your seven years of past addresses, you may need to gather that information. I think all of you should go ahead and start it now to just know what it is you need to gather. Again, none of you can submit it until March 9th, until you get that certificate of completion and you get your background check. I know, as I said at the start of this, I know some of you are ready to go. So you may wanna start this process now. Some of you may want to wait until you finish. You may not want to order your background check until you finish this class. I can't tell you. There's no wrong way to do it, and I can't tell you how to do it. You know your agenda, and you know what's best for you. Remind me, how long after this class, after you get your certificate of completion, how long is your certificate of completion good for? Three whole years. Don't wait three years. I'm telling you, please don't wait. Three. Don't go until you're ready and do not wait three years. If you fail your exam and then the makeup exam, well, you have to, you don't have to take the class over for three years. Your certificate of completion from the class is good for three years. Your application is good for 180 days. You can go as many times as you can fit in that 180 days. A couple other things. Um, do you upload your certificate for them to know you completed the course? No, you guys don't have to do anything. Lane will submit to you. It's, it's a two-fold system. So you can't do anything without Lane. So she'll submit you and then you'll do your application. By the way, there's two pieces on your application that you can't answer until you get your certificate of completion. Your certificate of completion will include my instructor code and the school's code. So those are two pieces you'll need to submit your application. But yeah, Lane reports it as well. So it's like a two-fold system. Is there a different test each time you take the exam? That's a great question. Um, so there's a test bank. There's like thousands of test questions out there. And they may say they're going to give you 26 questions on agency. 
And every time you sit down, they're going to pull from that test bank 26 questions. So if you go again, you may see similar questions, but you may also see different questions. So they're just going to pull random number of questions for each category. And what that does is prevents me from taking the exam and running out the parking lot and telling you what's on it. So if you go back, you may not see the exact same questions, but you're still going to see, for example, 26 questions on agency. Where do you get your background check? It all starts here. When you go to apply for a license, the link for your background check is going to be in here as well. Once we get that new book in March, we'll be able to see the breakdown of the number of questions for each topic. And I, I do believe it's 26 questions on agency. Um, there's a lot on agency, as we've been saying. But we'll look at that breakdown again when we get that book on March 1st. I was just looking that March 1st this year is a Saturday. I know it's a Friday. So we'll talk about it on March 5th. Also on the commission's website, again, back up at the top, I think the two tabs that would benefit you guys the most right now, I mean, here's your education tab, licensing tab, but I think the two tabs that would benefit you guys, if you wanted to poke around and look at stuff, is the publications and the resource tab, because there's just, I'm, I'm getting ready to sound like I'm repeating myself, but you see if I click on publications, publications, does everybody see that? Publications, publications. And there's so many good resources down here. Um, here's some guides. You know those Q&A brochures that we've been seeing in the online learning system? This is exactly where I get them from. Every single one of them, plus more, are here. Um, some past bulletin information, manual, CE information. Again, you guys, I don't want you spending all your study time here. Uh, but I do think if you... Um, you know, you get some downtime and you're playing around on the internet. There's such a plethora of information on this website and it's such a good opportunity. It's so much information to not only educate the public, uh, but also help educate uh, us as well. I know their search bar is pretty, pretty intuitive. Have you guys ever searched for something and you get results of anything but what you searched for? No, nah, they're good. They're good. So if you keep your search generic, if you want to find like material facts, you can put in material facts and it'll pull up everything you've ever wanted to know about material facts and more. But again, we're not spending all of our study time here. Just introducing you to it. And the other thing I want to point out real quick. Back on the home page. Once you guys leave pre and post, you need to know where to find the current information. And it's right there on the homepage. Current license law and commission rule. We're providing it to you now. But once you leave us, you always need to know where to access the current. So there's your license law and rules. Again, our state specific section. What else on your state? Your application, your state exam. Anything on our end of class exam? So, Julie, our in the class exam, that's of, on everything, the whole book, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, they say if we do, which we are going by the syllabus, and we'll cover everything you need to know for your state exam. Um, if you guys have looked ahead again in the Julie folder, what's going to be on your exam? Boom. But we still have to go through everything on the syllabus. How many retakes for my end of class exam? Just one on March 16th. Uh, what happens if you don't pass the end of class exam you, and the retake, then you got to retake the class. So you only get one shot to pass one retake. And if you don't, then you got to retake the class. 
to get your certificate of completion, you have to complete the course. Completing the course is passing the exam. Passing my exam is 75% also. Yep, minimum of 75%. And it's 112 questions. I know that's the next question. Stop typing, 112 questions. <laughs> so two tests stay in between you and your license. The end of class exam with an accredited pre-licensing school, your state exam. There's your goals. End of class exam first, state exam next. <laughs> yeah, the midterm's part of it. <laughs> Anything else? Can we move on from exam talk? Yes, because I have knots in my stomach now. <laughs> Please <laughs> breathe, breathe. <laughs> oh goodness! Yeah. We we go over my exam. I'm going to go over some rules and expectations. That's like the very last thing that we do. By the way, is rules and expectations for my exam, and that's the first piece of recommendation, best piece of advice I can offer you during these exams, is to breathe. Not short labored breaths, soothing, relaxing breaths in through the nose, out through the mouth. So when you see a test question and you go, oh, I've never seen this before in my entire life, stop and breathe. It's amazing what taking, closing your eyes and taking a couple deep breaths can do for you. Anything else? Y'all want to Kahoot? Yay! Let's Kahoot. So this Kahoot is our contracts Kahoot. So this is going to be nine and ten. Here is your QR code. If you're accessing the website or the app, you need a game pin. If you want to play, give you 30 more seconds or so to get in. And if you don't want to play on your phone, that's fine. But at least play in your mind. Opportunity to see how you're doing. Kahoot, nine and 10, contracts. Question number one, a void contract is one that is
10 seconds. A void contract is one that is not legally enforceable. That's right. Remember, contracts are either valid or void. And that's up to who to determine if they're valid or void. The judge. Me and you? That's right. The judge. So what the judge is looking for are those essential elements. And if we don't have a, those essential elements, then we have a void contract. In a sense, we never had a contract to begin with. One that is not as in writing, not in writing, is unenforceable. It's a valid contract, but you can't enforce it because it is in writing. Questions on this one? Let's see what we got. Ashley Bag Bagley came out the gate. Answer the fastest, followed by Courtney and Rachel. Little emoji, we'll call you, and Delena. Question number two. The essential elements of any type of contract include all of the following except. Ten seconds. Essential elements include all the following except agency disclosure. Remember, what, what does it mean to disclose? To tell what to uh, tell, contract you're going under. To, to tell about agency. So that's not contract formation. That has nothing to do with contracts. Consideration, that's probably the biggest problem topic of our um, essential elements. Consideration is anything of value. There's no such thing as a free promise. All promises come with some kind of consideration and any legally binding contract has to have some form of consideration. Typically speaking, consideration is money. When we talk about our offer to purchase and contract, the consideration is the uh, purchase price. But it's anything of value. Is um, a free gas card something of value? Sure. Is six months rent something of value? Yes. So it may not come in the form of money. In exchange for a weekend at the beach, is that something of value? Right. So it's such consideration is anything of value. Um, so what isn't essential for contract formation is agency disclosure. Questions on this one. So Ashley's staying on top, LaDawn's on the board, Courtney's still on, Bex is on, Nisi's on. Shelby's our highest climber. She's up third, oh, I'm sorry, 11 places. Question number three, the law requiring real estate contracts be in writing to be enforceable. seconds. What's Connor tell me? That needs to be recorded. Connor says there are certain documents that need to be recorded. Statute of fraud says there are certain documents that need to be in writing. Connor, record. Statute of frauds in writing. Questions on this one.
shuffled around a bit. Courtney's on top. Marina's on the board on fire this round with three in a row. Ashley Bagley's still on. Rochelle's on. Finesse is on. If the seller makes a counter offer, the prospective buyer is. Eight seconds. Good job. The buyer is relieved. A counter offer is a rejection. So the buyer makes an offer, the seller counters it. They're bouncing it back. They're throwing the ball back in the buyer's court. When the seller counters it, the buyer has three choices. They can accept it, reject it, or counter it. Nobody is bound to anything until we have acceptance and communication of acceptance. Until we have those two steps, nobody's obligated to do anything. Questions on this one? Courtney stayed on top. Rochelle's up. Marina's still on the board. Bex is up. Ashley Bag Bagley's still on. Leisha's up six places, our highest climber this round. Question number five, to rescind a contract. One is... Ten seconds. If you're rescinding it, you're canceling it. You're taking it back. If you put down any deposits or fees, you'll get your money back. If you rescind a contract, both parties go about their lives as if that never happened. Nobody's out money. Nobody's out anything. Questions on this one? Courtney stand on top, Bex is up, Marina, Rachelle, and Nisi. Five of you are on fire with an answer streak of three. To assign a contract for the sale of real property. What are you doing if you're assigning? seconds. If you're signing a contract, you are transferring your rights and responsibility. You're assigning your duties to another party. If you assign a contract, all the terms stay the same. The only thing that changes is the name of one of the parties. You're signing your rights and responsibilities. Questions on this one? I think that shuffled up much, did it? Courtney and Bex, Marina, Rochelle and Nisi, uh, three of you are on fire with your answer streak of four. And the last one, in the event of the seller's breach, the buyer can sue the seller and force them to sell. This is called...
six seconds. Doing the seller and forcing them to sell. This is called specific performance. Remember, if you're awarded specific performance, if the judge awards specific performance, what are they making the seller do? They're making them perform as promised. And what's the seller promising in the contract? To sell. So they can make the seller sell. They can make the seller perform as promised. Consequential damages are your money damages. It's damages that the injured party could go after. Uh, we talked about the buyer. They could go after the seller for their due diligence, their earnest money, and all the money they paid for their inspections and investigations. With consequential damages, I always think of like receipts and invoices. You can prove you paid the home inspector. You can prove you paid the surveyor. Questions on this one? All right, I think that was it. Yeah. So our third place winner this round is Rachel. Our second place winner is Bex. And our first place is Courtney. We've got fourth and fifth runners up of Marina and I think that's Future Broker. Popped up on the screen there at the last minute. When I was, uh, when we were still in person, pre-pandemic, um, I always gave, I need to stop sharing just for one second. So you guys should be looking at each other now. But I was awarded the podium winners, a candy bar of their choosing. So since I can't do that anymore, why don't y'all go candy bar shopping tomorrow? Go get you a candy bar. You worked hard. You deserve it. Sometimes you need a candy bar. Any questions? Julie, did, did yeah. the question that the answer was statute of frauds did it reference state law or did it reference rule statute of frauds is a state ah oh, statute of frauds might mean i'm not sure if it's state specific or not is and the reason i asked i took a a one of the uh extra additional tests today uh -huh. and I, I thought i had it right but it was the reverse of how it was answered just now. So that's why I'm trying to make sure. I'll right. find know, it and send it to you. Yeah, I know. Send me that question. I know the Connor Act is a state-specific thing, um, but statute of frauds, and I hesitate because statute of fraud, its whole purpose is try to prevent fraud and forgery. So that's why I'm kind of reluctant to know that it's a state-specific thing. Um, but yeah, Connor Act is a state law that says there are certain documents that need to be recorded. Statute of Fraud says there are certain documents that need to be in writing. Both are so they're enforceable. And I'm just trying right. to look through. And it was a parole evidence rule was the actual answer. So the parole evidence rule is the one that says the final written word mm -hmm. will prevail. So any previous negotiations, if they don't make it to the final contract, they didn't make it. So yeah, if you if you any any questions you guys have, <laughs> any questions you have questions on. Um, shoot me, shoot me an email. Screenshots sure. help me a lot. I'm happy to help. And I was just trying to find, of course, it's like a kid, right? No. Um, I'll send it to you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. But yeah, guys, remember, especially, I mean, what the heck? We're halfway there. So the good news is we're halfway there. The rest of the news is we still have halfway to go. So as you guys are getting more in depth, I know a lot of you are going to start, um, really preparing this weekend so you can take your midterm when you get stuck on something please feel free to shoot me a text or an email and i'll get back to you. i may not get back to you right away but i will get back to you anything else we're getting ready to switch gears all together
told you we had a lot to do tonight, didn't we? So here's that big deep breath. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Are you ready? Didn't that feel nice? That's good. Remember to do that. It's so important. We are in our financing unit. 14 is about the principles. 15 is more about the day-to-day -day in practice. I'll be very honest with you guys. Um, 14 and 15, the financing units tend to, uh, just in general, be a bit of a struggle. I think part of the reason is because there's math, um, which we'll talk about. But I think another part of the reason, now we're teaching you how to speak lender, right? So we've got you just started thinking about a broker, but now we got to shift gears just a bit. And so the best way I think to get through 14 and 15 is to put on your lender hat that y'all didn't know you had until this very moment. Um, I have a feeling when you guys signed up for this class, you didn't know how in depth in the lending process we're getting ready to get. But let's be honest, the lending process is a huge part of the real estate buying and selling process. Uh, the majority of our buyers need to get a loan. Now, obviously you may have a buyer, cash buyer, but I think most of our buyers need to get through a loan. We still need to stay in our lane and we still need to have these buyers talk to lenders um, or their lender, but it's still important that we have a basic understanding of what the lending process is about so we can assist our buyers through. through. So lender hats on, units 14 and 15. In 14, we're gonna distinguish between a title theory state and a lien theory state, and of course, talk about which one is North Carolina. We're gonna talk about some basic provisions of the promissory note and the deed of trust. We have said the deed of trust is just the mortgage. So we're gonna talk about what that mortgage is in North Carolina. We just happen to refer to it as a deed of trust. And then there's another instrument, another agreement referred to as the promissory note. And then we got some math to do in unit 14. I doubt we'll get to it tonight. So we know we have that to look forward to first thing Tuesday night next week. We may get a little bit into it tonight. We'll just have to wait and see. So unit 14, first thing we need to do is define some words. Some states call it a mortgage. North Carolina calls it a deed of trust. One and the same can be used interchangeably. The mortgage is the pledge of real estate as security. Every single one of us say the word mortgage wrong. So right now I got to undo what we thought we knew a mortgage was. Right now we think the mortgage is that thing that we pay every month, right? We send the lender a payment every month and that's called mortgage. I got to undo that. We got to unring that bell. The mortgage is the pledge of the real estate as security. The lender needs some kind of something to hang on to, some kind of something to have in the event of the borrower's default. Understand this going into it. The lender's job is to make money. They're an investor. Investors make money. They loan you money. And yes, you have to pay for that money that they loan you. And if you don't uphold your end of the agreement, then they have the mortgage, they have that pledge, which means they could default on the property, sell it to get their money back. You promised them that you would pay them. When you stop, they need to act. The mortgage or is the give or of the mortgage. The mortgagee is the receiving of the mortgage. Break these down, the mortgage or is the borrower, or if I can do a little play on words, the mortgage or is the borrower. They are giving the mortgage to the lender, to the mortgagee. So the mortgage or is the borrower giving that pledge of security to the mortgagee, the lender. In return, the lender gives, the mortgagee gives the mortgagor, the lender gives the borrower equitable title. Equitable title 
allows the borrower to live in a property, to possess the property, to treat it as if they, it was their own. Consider something. Lenders get a bad rap, and, and I honestly don't know why. Consider this. Let's say you want to run out and buy a $100,000 home. And you call the lender and you say, I want a 90% loan. You're asking the lender to give you $90,000. How much interest do you have in the property? How much are you bringing to the table? You're bringing $10,000, right? I mean, your $10,000 is cute and all, but who has the biggest interest of this property? Who has the biggest, the biggest interest? You only brought $10,000. You only brought 10%. The lender has an interest in this property until you get them paid off. And how they can protect that interest is to issue the mortgage. But again, they give the borrower that equitable title. They give them uh, permission to use the property. If the borrower defaults, it means that they fail to make a payment. If they fail to make numerous payments in a row, they may be dealing with foreclosure. How many payments? That's an agreement between the lender and the borrower. There you go. <laughs> so they may say, they may say, you know, if you miss three payments, if you miss two, it's all negotiable between the lender. Well, that's not negotiable. I'm sorry, but the lender is going to have their um, how many months can you miss? If you're in default, you're not in foreclosure. You're a step closer to foreclosure, but you still have the opportunity to avoid foreclosure by getting yourself caught up. Hypothecation is the act of pledging the real property as security. So the act of giving the mortgage to the lender, that act is referred to as hypothecation. You're pledging that property as security. It's the lender's safety net. It's what they have to hang on to in the event of the borrower's default. As previously mentioned, there are two different states. There's a lien theory state and a title theory state. The lien theory state is not North Carolina. The lien theory state uses a two-party instrument where they have the mortgage or the mortgagee. The document is the mortgage. In a lien theory state, the borrower has legal and equitable title. So they have the legal title and they have the right to possess the property, the right to live there. In lien theory states, when the borrower defaults, they have to go through a judicial foreclosure process. If you're going through a judicial foreclosure process, that means you have to go stand in front of a judge. Can we see a play on words there? A judicial foreclosure process means that this is a court ruling. It's costly, it's timely, I imagine it's very exhausting. So other states, and I don't know specific what other states, but other states, maybe a lien theory state, North Carolina is a title theory state. In a title theory state, we use a three-party instrument. We have the grantor, or the mortgagor, or the borrower. Please hear my play on words. The grantor is the borrower. The beneficiary is the lender. The trustee is an impartial third party that handles the affairs on behalf of the beneficiary. The trustee is going to be an attorney some kind of relationship that the lender has with an attorney. And in the event of default, the trustee handles the foreclosure on behalf of the beneficiary. The document we use is the deed of trust. Again, deed of trust and mortgage is used interchangeably. 
The borrower has equitable title. The trustee has legal title. And North Carolina is a power of sale foreclosure. We do not have to go through a judicial foreclosure process. Power of sale says in the event of default, the attorney has the power to sell. The trustee has the power to sell the property on behalf of the beneficiary. Get them their money back. When you take on a mortgage in North Carolina, you agree in your contract with the lender. If I default after so many months, you have the power to sell the property. We don't have to get a judge to tell us. We don't have the time and the cost and the heartache that lien theory states may have. Questions so far? Take our last break.
come back. How we doing? Good for the last hour? I know numerous of you told me you weren't feeling well tonight, so I hope you get to feeling better this weekend. Up your vitamin C, elderberry, whatever the current thing is, I don't know. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to take attendance. Ew, strep, that's no fun. All right. So lean theory versus title theory. A couple more terms here. There's two different instruments between the lender and the borrower. Uh, the first interest in instrument is the financing instrument, also known as the promissory note. The other one is the security instruments that pledge a security. So mortgage and other states deed of trust in North Carolina. We're going to come back to the promissory note. So for right now, let's talk about our security instrument. Again, the difference is what state you're standing in. So know that these words are used interchangeably. Um, the promissory note is the bilateral contract between the lender and the borrower. The deed of trust is the security instrument. The deed of trust is the one that gets recorded on public records to protect the lender's interest. The lender doesn't want the borrower to sell the house and run away and never be heard from again. So how they protect their interest? They file a lien down at the courthouse. So when everybody's going to buy, the attorney pulls up, does the title search, and finds that security instrument. Let's just talk about our deed of trust. And there's a couple things about it. Um, first off, here are these essential elements again, these required ingredients. If the judge gets their hand on a deed of trust, they're determined if it's good or not, this is what they're looking for. The deed of trust has to refer to the promissory note. The two cross-reference each other. It needs to clearly state on there that that's what it is. It's the security. It's the lender's safety net in the event of the borrower's default. I'm going to name the lender and the borrower. Those are the two parties. We're going to have an accurate legal description. Statute of fraud says it needs to be in writing and signed by all parties. Connor Act says it needs to be recorded. And then it's got to be delivered to and accepted by the lender or the trustee on behalf of the lender. So remember, the trustee is acting on the benefit of the beneficiary, also known as the lender. There's some obligations of both parties, lender and borrower. They have duties and responsibilities to each other. So obligations of the borrower, their biggest responsibility is to Make those payments on time. That's part of what you're signing in that promissory note. For example, if you're taking on a 30-year mortgage, you're agreeing to pay X amount over the next 360 months. 30 times 12 is 360. That's a long time. That's a long commitment, isn't it? That's a 30-year mortgage. So you agree to make those payments. The borrower has the obligation to pay taxes and maintain insurance. Most lenders will escrow the taxes and insurance. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Most lenders will escrow the taxes and insurance, which means my homeowner's on the call. When you're making your mortgage payment, your mortgage payment every month, when you're sending that payment into the bank every month, some of it includes your principal, some of it includes your interest. Then you also have a 12th of this year's taxes and a 12th of this year's homeowner's insurance. And by escrowing it in, by sending in a 12th each month, the lender can hang on to that on behalf of the borrower. And when those bills come due, they can pay them on behalf of the borrower. Doesn't that sound nice? If you have a lender, 
I get a letter once a year from Randolph County that says your taxes have been paid. And I think, well, gee, that's nice. And I get an email from Allstate once a year that says your homeowner's insurance has been paid. And I think, golly, that's so kind of the lender to pay these bills on my behalf. Wrong. It is nice, but the lender doesn't do it for me. They do it to protect themselves. What if they didn't? Let's go into a pretend world for a second. What if they didn't pay taxes on your behalf? And you decide, I'm going to save money and I'm not going to pay taxes this year or next year or the year after that. Eventually, the county is going to come after you, aren't they? And they're going to come after you probably in the means of a foreclosure. The county is only going to care about collecting the money that they're owed. Do you think the county cares about what the lender is due? No. Remember our lien priorities, all those people standing in line waiting to get their money out? The county's going to get paid first. Real property taxes or superior liens. All of the liens paid in the order in which they recorded except for the uh, mechanics lien. So the lender is trying to prevent the county from foreclosing on you so that they have a better chance of getting their money. Same thing with insurance. If you're going through a lender, homeowner's insurance is required, period, end of story, because they're protecting their interest. If you don't have insurance and the house burns down, what's stopping you from driving off in the sunset never to be heard of again? So they're going to require insurance, and most of them are going to um, escrow this taxes and insurance on your behalf. Oh, yeah, especially this year. Taxes and insurance, we can expect up. Um, other obligations of the borrower. They got to maintain the property. They can't destroy the property. Again, the lender still has an interest in this property until it's been paid in full. And then most lenders, part of your promissory note, has some kind of authorization from the lender before any major alterations or demolition. Again, just protecting their interest. We're going to talk more about the taxes and insurance thing in your monthly payment in just a bit. So if these are the obligations of the borrower. The borrower also has the borrower also has some rights. There, there's that equitable title again. They have the right to possess and use the property. The right of defeasance, this is what we wake up and go to work for every single day. Once you pay that lender off, the right of defeasance says they're going to take their lien away. You have no longer no more obligations. So once you make that last payment, they're out of the picture. They no longer have an interest. And then the right of redemption, the borrower has the opportunity to redeem themselves in the event of foreclosure talking more on that in just a few minutes. You know, if you're redeeming yourself, you're saving yourself. So they have the right to save themselves from foreclosure. Again, more on that in just a second. Like we said, this is a two-way street. So the lender has some rights as well. The lender has the right to assign the debt. Remind me what an assignment is. Changing the name. Exactly. You, all the terms stay the same. The only thing that changes is the name of one of the parties. And in this case, the name that's changing is the lender. Again, my homeowner's on the call. Most lenders service the loan, which means most lenders sell the loan to other lenders. When they do that, as the borrower your interest rate stays the same. Your payment amount stays the same. The due date stays the same. The only thing that changes is the name of the lender. Why they may service your loan or assign your debt, we're going to talk about that in Unit 15. So hang on to that for just a second. The other right that the lender has is to foreclose in the event of the borrower's default. And in North Carolina, in that promissory note, we give them the power of sale foreclosure. We give them the power to sell the property 
in the event of the borrower's default. So just to recap, judicial foreclosure, other states may use a ju judicial foreclosure, that's the court process. The deed used in a judicial foreclosure is the sheriff's deed. The way I always remember this, remember what we said, if you're going through the judicial, you're talking to the judge, right? If the judge takes your property, the judge themselves isn't gonna come take seize the property, are they? They're gonna send the sheriff out to do it. So the sheriff's deed is with our judicial foreclosure states. North Carolina is a non-judicial foreclosure, which means we use the power of sale foreclosure. The deed used in a power of sale foreclosure is the trustee's deed. That trustee is the third party that handles the affairs on behalf of the beneficiary, also known as the lender. Other states may use a strict foreclosure. We don't do a strict foreclosure in North Carolina, um, but other states may use a strict foreclosure in which the courts, got to go back to the courts, and the courts establish a specific period of time in which the balance must be paid in full. I don't think we see strict foreclosure much anymore, so I won't worry about that. But judicial in North Carolina is a non-judicial. In the event of foreclosure, the bank is acting, the lender, I should say, is acting because the borrower has missed X amount of payments. What is that X amount? That's all on the lender's policy. So they all have different, could be two months, could be six, whatever. But once the foreclosure process is started, remember our lien priority back in unit five? In the event of foreclosure, that lien priority shuffles around just a bit. So in the event of foreclosure, the first one that gets paid is now going to be the trustee, the cost of the sale, the cost of the foreclosure. So we got to pay the trustee, the court fees, whatever else is involved. Once we pay that, then we pay our superior liens real property taxes and government special assessments. Then you pay the deed of trust, pay the lender that started the foreclosure process. I mean, look at it. They started it and they're third in line. There's a risk for them, isn't there? Another reason why they pay your taxes on your behalf. Because if the county forecloses on you, like we said, they don't care about collecting enough money to pay the deed of trust. All they care about is collecting enough money to pay themselves. Makes sense, right? So after that, we pay the deed of trust. After that, we pay all other liens in the order in which they're recorded, except for the mechanics lien. It's paid in the order in which the work began. It's unit three stuff. And then if, and hear me stress the word if, <laughs> if there's anything left over at the end of that, the surplus will go to the borrower, which in this case is gonna be the homeowner. The homeowner is the borrower because they are the one foreclosing. Here's the deal. Creditors can't make more than what they're due, than what they're owed. So nobody can collect more than that outstanding balance. So if we foreclose and sell the property, pay everybody off, and if, there's anything left, and I doubt this happens often. Because quite frankly, if there's gonna be money left, you could probably sell it and pay these people off and avoid foreclosure. I think most people wanna avoid foreclosure if at all possible. Um, foreclosures will stay on your credit for seven years, which means you may have a very difficult time getting another loan during that time. You may have a difficult time getting another loan. It just depends on the situation. But this is the lien priority. And the big change is the cost of the sale, the first. Superior liens, deed of trust, all of the liens are paid in the order in which they're recorded. Except for the mechanics lien. Uh, which is superior, real property taxes or special assessment taxes? Yep, they'll get paid first. And then hear me, government special assessment. This is not HOA. 
special assessments. They don't get that kind of, they're not there. <laughs> so government special assessments. Uh, we mentioned redemption. Most lenders will give borrowers the opportunity to redeem themselves. There's a nice picture for us, bottom page 388. Other states may use an equity of redemption period, which means the borrower has the opportunity to redeem themselves before the foreclosure sale. North Carolina uses a statutory redemption period, which means the borrower has the right to redeem themselves, come up with the amount due after the sale. So we have the foreclosure sale. And then in North Carolina, we have what's referred to as a 10 day upset period, a 10 day bid period. So that borrower has 10 days to come up with the amount due. And quite frankly, you guys, if they can do that, we probably wouldn't have been in foreclosure to begin with, but they still give them an opportunity. They're not going to get a loan. They're not going to be able to get a loan. So they're going to have to, you know, come up like, like, like dig cash out of their mattress or call the bank of mom and dad or something. But if they can come up with it 10 days after the sale, then they can avoid, they can save themselves from redemption. I mean, save themselves from foreclosure. There we go. Redeem themselves. After the foreclosure, after the sale, if there are any creditors that weren't paid in full, if there were any creditors that didn't get their money, maybe the sale of the property wasn't as much as what was owed. Remember, all those people standing in line, when the money's out, the money's out. There's no other money to go once we dwindle down the sales price. So if there's anybody in the rest of the line that didn't get paid, they have the opportunity to file a deficiency judgment. Remember, a judgment is a general lien. Who can remind me what general liens attach to? Person. That's right. So if you don't file, if you don't have enough to pay it off, they file a deficiency judgment on you. That's going to follow the person until it is paid in full. Now we're not talking about, now you're not just getting a home loan. You're not getting a car loan. You may have struggles with uh, any kind of medical assistance, something like that. In North Carolina, seller financing, which we touched on, we're going to touch on a little bit later. Uh, but in North Carolina, the seller, if they are acting as the lending institution, if they are doing seller financing, they can't file a deficiency judgment because they're already top of the line. They're the ones that started the, the foreclosure process to begin with. Some borrowers may have an option to um, not do foreclosure. They're still underwater. They still owe more than what the property's worth. But some lenders will allow borrowers to do a short sale instead of a foreclosure. So let's talk about a short sale. In order to have a short sale, we have to have these three pieces. All three pieces are required for a short sale. So the first piece for a short sale, the seller's underwater which means they owe more than what I can sell the house for. The purchase price isn't enough to pay off all those lien holders. The second piece is that the seller doesn't have sufficient liquid assets to make up the difference. What's a liquid asset? Cash. Red, quick, yeah, yeah, cash, readily available, right? So... They're going to look at savings accounts, stocks, bonds. Do you have readily available cash? The third piece is that we have to have all lien holders approval. All lien holders have to agree 
to participate in the short sale. What they're agreeing to, if they agree to do the short sale, what they're agreeing to is to allow the seller to convey, the borrower to convey title while they accept less than what they're owed. And every single lien holder has to agree to this in order for the short sale to happen. So I'm gonna walk through the process in just a second. I do wanna say though, short sales for the borrower are better than a foreclosure because a short sale doesn't stay with you as long. We just said a foreclosure will hang around for seven years. Short sales only stick around for about three. So your credit, it, your credit isn't uh, hindered as long. Uh, you might be able to get out, out of it quicker than doing a foreclosure, that process. Whether or not the borrower can do the short sale versus a foreclosure is going to be up to the lender. The main lender, the, the, the superior lender, um, is going to have to agree to allow this to happen. So let's walk through the process. You have a house listed, and it's going to be listed as a potential short sale. Potential short sales in North Carolina are material fact. If it's a potential short sale, we have to disclose that. So you have this listing that's a potential short sale. An offer comes in. Buyer and seller negotiate the offer like they always do. They're not going to negotiate purchase price and earnest money and dates and all that stuff like they always do. Once that offer becomes a contract, only then does the lien holder start their process to see if they will approve it. A lien holder is not going to start, or the lien holders are not going to start their process until we have a bona fide contract in our hand. That's why when you listed it, you called it a potential short sale. I can't guarantee that the lien holder is going to allow it and they won't even touch it until we're under contract. Don't let the name fool you. Short sales have nothing to do with the length of time that these things take. Short sales are named so because the seller is short on funds. The seller is short on what they owe. They say on average, you can expect six months for get lien holders approval. So from the time we go under contract to that we get closer to the end there, we're waiting. We're just waiting. The name of the game with short sales is patience. <laughs> we're waiting for the lien holders all of them to approve. All of them have to approve. All of them have to agree to accept less than what they're owed. And if one lien holder doesn't agree, the short sale can't go through and that borrower is probably facing foreclosure. So with short sales, what this means for us like we said, potential or possible short sales and material fact. We gotta let potential buyers know that this is a possible short sale, SS is short sale. Listing agents, we need to have our sellers talk to everybody. They gotta call their attorney, they gotta call their accountant. CYA, CY accountant, CY attorney, call your. Selling agents, we need to discuss with the seller the process. Uh, we briefly mentioned our short sale addendum. I may try to look at that in a second. Let me see where we are briefly, because I do think it's a good form. It does a really good job of explaining the short sale process. Some of you uh, may have been around in some form or fashion in real estate, 08, 09, 2010. Some of you may have heard about, anybody remember the um, housing market crash? It was absolutely as unpleasant as what, um, as what it was called. Um, the housing market crash, we dealt with a lot of foreclosures and a lot of short sales. And we've been saying all along, markets are, they fluctuate, 
right? There's highs and lows to markets. There are a kajillion theories out there about what went wrong, what caused the housing market crash, and we're not getting into all those. But one theory uh, was fraudulent lending practice, shady lenders. And now you have all these borrowers. I mean, y'all, it used to be so easy to get a loan. It was like Oprah giving them out. You get a loan, you get a loan, you get a loan. Everybody gets a loan. All you had to do was have a name and a social security number. And guess what? You get a home loan. There were some lenders that were letting the borrower tell them their debt to income ratio. They weren't verifying it. They were just on the phone going, how much money do you make? What's your debt? That's not good. This is today why we have to verify that why the lenders have to verify. You got, yep. Yep. It was it was an interesting time. We'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, my point is that we saw a lot of short sales during that time. Um, if I had a crystal ball, I predict we're gonna see short sales and foreclosures coming back. Not like housing market crash, foreclosures and short sales. But guys, remember, we're coming out of this crazy seller's market. Buyers were paying five digits, six digits, more than asking price. And if something happens, what if the main income earner passes away? They're not going to be able to fulfill that obligation. What if they get a job transfer? What if, what if, what if? So I think we're going to be dealing with foreclosures and short sales again. I don't think it's going to be housing market crash, but I do think we're going to see these again sooner rather than later. And what I have to say to you is I remember I was in it. I was still an admin. I wasn't in sales yet, um, but I was still an admin. And I remember one of our sales meetings, we had an attorney come in and talk to us about short sales and make sure we're handling them properly. If you ever get called to list a short sale, a potential short sale, you need to get your BIC involved. We need to make sure we're handling this properly. If your buyer's interested in one, then you just need to explain to them the process, show them the short sale addendum. I've done two, both as a buyer's agent. Uh, my first one was about four months long. My second one was 11 and a half. The name of the game is patience, but y'all, they had like three outstanding mortgages. They had a failed startup business. They had a lien to the IRS. I don't know what you know about the IRS, but they're not known for their rapid response. 11 and a half months from the day we went under contract to the day we got short sale approval. When I say it's a process, it's a process. And all you can do is just sit still and be patient and wait to get that confirmation. So the buyers need to be aware of this. Julie, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, being that short sales are such complicated transactions, are you still asking for like due diligence fee and earnest money and all that in the contract? You know, earnest money, and I'll be honest, Rochelle, with mine, again, it was a different market, but with mine, some some lenders may not allow the seller to collect due diligence because why is the lender going to let them make money if they're not making money? You know, some lenders may not allow the sellers to make repairs. We know that they don't have to, but the lender may specifically say no. Cause again, if you got five grand to throw down at the electrician, why aren't you giving that to me? So the lenders may have some regulations. Um, mine were different markets and I'll be honest we went in for both of mine. I went in zero with due diligence, but we went in heavy with earnest money, heavy with earnest money, which just hung out in an escrow account. And the short sale addendum specifically says, if we don't get lien holders approval, if this doesn't move forward, the buyer's going to get their earnest money back. So it was just putting it up to show their good faith. Now, again, it's all negotiable and the parties have to agree and the lenders very well may have a say so in it. Um, but that was just my experience. And that was, I don't know how many years ago, oh, nine, 10, 11, I don't know. It was, it's been a while. Time gets away from me. The 
the 11 and a half month one, I got to share this, the 11 and a half month one, the listing agent, she was, she was amazing. Um, her email signature boasted herself as a foreclosure and short sale specialist. I thought, bless her heart. That is a heck of a way of making a living. But that was her niche. That was her market that she found. And she was really good. My other short sale, I don't know that the listing agent had ever heard of short sale. She had no idea what was going on. None whatsoever. So just having that knowledge coming into it. Uh, makes all the difference too. So what I say to you guys, again, if you ever get called to list a short sale, please, or a potential short sale, please go straight to your BIC. Make sure you go into this with knowledge. It definitely makes for a smoother transaction. Nothing I can do about the time, but at least that, that niche. When the seller sells, remember you guys, the seller is the borrower of their current loan. The buyer is the borrower of their new loan. So any relationship with the lender and the person is the borrower. If the seller has an outstanding mortgage, they're the borrower. If the buyer's getting a mortgage, then they are the borrower. And when the seller's selling a property that still has an outstanding lien, an outstanding mortgage on the property, then there's a couple different options that the seller has. Uh, the first option we're getting ready to look at, I have no idea why, but it's not the book. And it's the most common method for sellers to sell. <laughs> I don't know why it's not in the book. So let's go off book for just a second. And when the borrower is selling property, mortgage property, what we see most common is referred to as a cash sale, which means the buyer pays the seller, the seller uses that money to pay off all their debt, pay off all those liens. The buyer pays the sales price. The sales price is what pays all the lien holders. And that's referred to as a cash sale. The seller uses the, bar the buyer's money. The seller uses the buyer's money to pay off their liens so they can convey clear marketable title. The other methods the seller may have to sell, sell a mortgage property, property with a mortgage on it, is going to be up to the lender. It might be at the discretion or the request of the lender. A lot of times sellers don't have a say so. It's part of what they agree to in their promissory notes. Um, but these are less common. So back to our book, there's something called subject to the mortgage, which means the seller sells the property but they keep all the liability. They remain liable. We don't see this much. Can we see why? Nobody, nobody is going to agree to keep that liability. That's part that should be part of conveying of selling the property is, is being done with that responsibility. So the seller, the buyer may be making the payments, but if they stop. Their liability remains on the seller, not the responsibility. I've never, and I don't know why we would, but it's in the syllabus and it's a green star. So that's all we're going to say about that. Another option could be for the buyer to assume the seller's mortgage, in which case the liability is mostly going to be on the buyer. But most of that's going to be on the um uh, on the, on the, I'm sorry, the liability may be on the seller, but most of it's going to be on the buyer. If the buyer's assuming the seller's mortgage, they're taking over the payments. So it might be that the seller makes their payment on February 1st. We convey the property on February 8th. The borrower makes the payment on March, or the buyer makes the payment on March 1st. The buyer now being the new owner. If you're assuming, if the buyer is assuming the seller's mortgage, they're taking over that mortgage payment. So let's say, for example, you're buying my house and you're assuming my mortgage and we agree on a purchase price of $100,000. 
And let's say I have a balance on my mortgage of $60,000. I'm just going to hand that liability over to you. I'm going to say, here you go. You take on my debt. I made the payment on February 1st. You make the payment on March 1st. But in addition to taking over my debt of $60,000 to make me whole, you still need to come up with $40,000 to pay me at settlement. So you're going to pay me the difference and then you're going to take over my debt. And the two will make me whole that purchase price of a hundred. Crystal ball again. I think we're going to start seeing these um, because when they're assumed, all the terms stay the same. And after the pandemic, we had historically low interest rates. People were getting mortgages for two point something three point something today they're back up to five point something six point something which by the way y'all is not bad at all that's more normal I think my parents bought their home 25 years ago it was like a 13 percent mortgage or some interest rate or something like that right talk to your parents and grandparents and see what they pay but what's happening now is that these two point something three point something interest rates when they start selling if their loan is assumable if the lender will allow it, then I can offer this product where you just take over my loan with all that interest paid down so far at a two point something versus originating a brand new loan at six point something. So if my house is for sale and the guy across the street is for sale and you can assume my loan at a two point something percent interest rate, I have a better I have a better chance of selling than the guy across the street that you can't assume their loan. So that's all it is. The buyer takes over the seller's payment and then you're going to bring find cash. Can you get a loan for it? You got to talk to a lender. Uh, by the way, if the loan is assumable, that borrower has to be approved by the lender. So they still have to go through the process right? It's not just any buyer out there. They still have to go through the process and they're going to, dang, Vaughn, that was unheard of. And they're going to, you know, qualify them and make sure that they can, they can keep on these payments. The second instrument is our promissory note. Again, this is the bilateral contract. Think of the promissory note. You may want to write this down. The promissory note is the IOU. The borrower owes the lender principal plus interest. We'll talk more about that. The promissory note is not recorded. It's just the contract, the IOU. Both parties sign, or the borrower signs promising to pay the lender back. It spells out all the terms. What's your interest rate? How much are you going to pay per month? How many months? Again, the only instrument that's recorded is the deed of trust because that's the security. The promissory note may be or may not be uh, a negotiable instrument. If it is negotiable, then the lender has the right to service it. If the lender's servicing it, then they are selling it or assigning it to another lender. Not all lenders service their loans. Some lenders keep them in-house. Some lenders service their own loans. So if they're going to keep it in-house, then they're probably dealing with a non-negotiable. Again, more on that process. Whether it can or cannot be assigned or assumed. Why they do that. We'll get into that next week in Unit 15.
there's a couple provisions uh, in the promissory note, a couple terms to be familiar with. Most promissory notes are gonna have an acceleration clause, which says if the borrower defaults, the lender has the right to accelerate the maturity of the debt. So if you miss X amount of payments, how do you stop yourself from foreclosure? You come up with the whole note due. We had an agreement. The borrower agreed to pay the lender X amount per month for so many months and they broke their promise. So now the lender can say, well, I'm gonna break mine. I want the whole note due, otherwise we may be dealing with foreclosure. Some lenders uh, may charge a prepayment penalty, prepayment penalty clause. So if you're gonna pay it off early, there might be a penalty. Prepayment penalties are not allowed in FHA and VA loans. We're going to talk about the different loan types in Unit 15 next week. Uh, FHA and VA loans do not allow prepayment penalties. Conventional loans are not allowed on amounts of $150,000 or less. So if we're dealing with a prepayment penalty, it's a conventional loan, $150,000 or more. I don't, lenders probably aren't doing this as much. You know, once upon a time ago, when our parents and grandparents bought houses, they, they they lived there until they died. And then the family lived there. I mean, they owned these homes for like 20, 30 years, right? That was the family home. Today, on average, are y'all ready for this? On average, across the country, we are selling and buying houses every eight to 10 years. So lenders go into this 30-year agreement knowing that you're probably going to sell before that 30 years is up. And if you sell before that 30 years, then that's money they're not getting. Money you promised, but they're not getting because you sold the home before that term. Now, with that being said, we're still not seeing, but there could still be a prepayment penalty in the promissory note. And then the due on sale clause says if there's any outstanding, if you're going to sell within 10 years or eight years, if there's any outstanding balance is due when? On the sale. So when you do only own that property for eight years or 10 years, part of your uh, lien priority, all those people standing there with their hands out is to pay the lender in full. Uh, if you take over payments on someone else's judgment and it stays in their name, do you have the right to evict you? So if there's a judgment, they've like shut the case on this. They're not accepting payments from you anymore. They're just going to put this judgment on you to pay in full. So somebody is not going to take over your judgment. So if there is a judgment outstanding balances, they probably won't let you assume the loan. You got to be in good standing to... Let it be assumed, you got to be in good standing to assume it. Uh, due on sale clause can also be referred to as the alienation clause. You are alienating yourself, separating yourself from the property before your term. Again, is it a 15-year loan, 30-year loan? It's all between the borrower and the lender. The due on sale clause will kickstart the acceleration clause. So if you go to sell your property and you still have 20 years to pay, they're gonna call the whole note due. That's your lien priority. That's all those people standing there with their hand out. So let's look at an example. A bank loaned Roy, a home purchaser, $350,000 at 4% interest rate, repayable in monthly installments for 30 years. Several years later, Roy defaulted by missing four payments, and he still owed $338,000. The bank sent a notice of default and gave Roy an opportunity to catch up on the missing payments, but Roy did not respond. The bank may initiate the acceleration clause if Roy doesn't come up with the whole note due. Now the bank is going to begin the foreclosure process. Lenders are in the business, they're investors. They're in the business of making money. 
they're not in the business of foreclosing. That's not what they want to do. It's something that they have to do if you break your promise. Most lenders will work with borrowers before default. It's just a matter of the borrower will reach out and contact them. And I imagine that's a really hard phone call to make. You know you're in default. You know you've missed. You're short or you've missed a month or two. The suggestion, the recommendation is that you reach out to the lender and say, I'm struggling. What can we do? They don't want to foreclose on you. They don't want to go through short sale because that takes time and resources away from them making money. So most lenders will work with you. Maybe they'll uh, reduce your payment for a couple months to help you get caught up. But I think the hard thing for borrowers is picking up the phone. Questions so far? I say so far, but don't go anywhere. I'm not done yet. Online learning system. If we look back up in the welcome section, there's a tab here for 2023 forms. And when we click on that, we get a link to Google Docs or Google Drive. And you can see all these forms, and we've talked about some of these. Um, you know, again, I don't want you guys studying. I've, I've told you the forms I want you to focus on, but in your spare time, you may want to just kind of peruse and click on something and see what it looks like. In here is our short sale addendum. Um, and I just want to, we're not going to go through all of this, but it does a really good job of explaining the short sale process. So there's the short sale defined, the three pieces that we just looked at. Um, it goes over some risks, buyer and seller understand and agree that the lien holder is not required to approve the short sale. We don't even know if they're going to consider it until we send them a contract. Um, the lien holders may require certain terms. I know somebody asked about due diligence or settlement date. Remember, we are sending them a contract. So we've already agreed to these things. If the lien holder comes back and says, we want to change this, nobody's obligated to agree to the lien holder's terms. Um, sellers may not be able to make repairs. If there is any due diligence, those costs are usually non-refundable. Here's the big thing. Nobody, buyer, seller, closing attorney, nor the brokers in this transaction have any control over the lien holder's approval, omission, or decision. The name of the game is patience. You submit it, they do their thing, and one day you get a phone call. And I tell you, after my 11 and a half months, that you know those moments in your life that you knew exactly where you were and what you were doing and you always remember yeah that was that was that was one of those moments for me yeah it was a it was a good phone call i've been waiting a long time for that phone call the other thing the short sale does it creates a contingency and the contingency is that remember b can't happen if a doesn't happen first the seller can't sell without the lien holder's approval. So if one lien holder says no, the seller's not obligated to sell. The contingency says, if we don't get the lien holder's approval, then the seller's not obligated to sell. The other thing this does is addresses dates. I don't know how long it's gonna be before we get approval. So I cannot put a number of day in Instead, what we may say is like due diligence is the 15th day from lien holder approval. Uh, settlement is 30 days from lien holder approval. Or we could negotiate other days. Once we get lien holder approval, the seller has to notify the buyer in writing. So page four of the short sale addendum handles that for us. Seller lets the buyer know that the lien holders, all of the lien holders have proved it. We are good to move forward. That was the phone call I got. It was a good day.
so again, you know, we just have these here for reference. Um, you know the forms. We've talked about the forms I want you guys to look at for your exams. Uh, but some of this, I mean, you might be bored one day and want to, I can't get rid of it now, and want to uh, just kind of look at, get an idea for some things. So they're here for you, available in the welcome section of the online learning system. What questions do I have? Reach out to me outside of class. Yep. All right, guys, what's next week look like? Uh, we're going to do 14. We're going to do 15. We're going to do some math next week. Bring your calculators. Bring your math brain. If math isn't your thing, I encourage you to look ahead. Look ahead at 14 and 15. Start exposing yourself to the math. Once we get through 14 and 15, we go on to 21. Don't forget your midterm starts at 12.05 tonight. You have till next Thursday. If I can answer any questions, if you're stuck on a problem, before you start banging your head on the desk, take a picture and shoot me an email. That's why I'm here. You guys got that point yet? <laughs> Y'all laugh because you know, right? Before, it's not necessary. It's not, ne I know sometimes I come in, I see bruises on foreheads. I'm like, guys, come on. <laughs> That's why you have me. Let me help. Just send, just take a picture, screenshot something. If you tell me to look at my book and I'm not at home, you're going to have to wait for me to get home. So send me a picture. Let me see it. Let me help. I'm going to leave. I'm going to stop recording a second. I'm going to leave the call open if the study group wants to, wants to connect. Um, but otherwise, you guys have a good weekend midterm, and we will see you guys on Tuesday. Rachel, can you stay on if you don't mind?